دكتور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Your Excellency President of KFPM Dr. Saqqaf Distinguished Speakers Dear Colleagues Ladies and Gentlemen Welcome to this workshop Water Security and Climate Change Organized by the Interdisciplinary Research Center of Membranes and Water Security My name is Samuel Jundi I am the Director of the Center Saudi Arabia is one of the largest uh, arid countries without permanent rivers uh, or lakes and is challenged by water scarcity. In fact, KSC is a country under severe water scarcity. Total water withdrawal in KSC is near 20 billion cubic meter, of which more than 90% is coming from groundwater, of which 50% is non-renewable. So long-term strategies for water security, as well as the development of sustainable and energy efficient technologies for water are urgently required. At the same time, Saudi Arabia is vulnerable to the impact of climate change that pose increasing risk to its water security, such as decrease in frequency and amount of precipitation and increase in temperature. In addition, most of Saudi Arabia has sensitive ecosystem for any level of climate change, especially on desertification processes. That's why today we have distinguished speakers from different parts of the world to talk about recent developments and trending topics in the field of water security and climate change. But before going to the first speaker, please allow me to welcome His Excellency, the President, Dr. Saqqaf, to start the workshop with his opening remarks. Uh, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahim, our uh, dear guests, uh, Dr. Yasin, Dr. Su, Dr. Beige, uh, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, conference and a small conference, it's the forum, and um, uh, we are discussing today a very important topic and one that is very dear to our hearts here at KFUBM because of multiple reasons. Uh, number one is that KFUBM uh, over the past couple of years has aimed to ensure that its research amplify, amplifies impact uh, on society and that its aims are primarily to improve the human condition. Uh, and hence we created a suite of new interdisciplinary research centers. This is one of them that address specific topics. They don't address specific disciplines. They are interdisciplinary with disciplines from multiple departments, all working together in unison to address these very important challenges. Challenges not only to Saudi Arabia, but challenges more importantly to the world as a whole. Water scarcity has become a big issue, uh, big issue in the US, United States, in California, and uh, others, big issue in India and other parts of the world that you would think have abundance of water, but it is the distribution of this water that can be quite problematic. And as we know, water is life, and therefore we must to together uh, get uh, with each other, uh, debate the issues, uh, propose solutions, develop solutions, uh, and do that in a way that would push the envelope of tackling this issue forward. So this uh, forum is very important because of the importance uh, of the topic, but it is also very important for two additional uh, uh, aspects to KFUBM. One is that it is organized by one of the new uh, interdisciplinary research centers uh, the, uh, uh, that uh, talks about uh, this important uh, topic uh, and that is led uh, by Dr. Jundi. And this is the first forum organized by this center and we hope that we'll have uh, numerous in the future on the topic of water and on other topics relevant to uh, its mandate. And number two, because it is part of our renewed interest in becoming a hub and a center of gravity for inter international 
fora and symposia and uh, conferences through our effort in KICS, the KFUBM uh, Institute for Knowledge uh, Exchange. And so it is important for two additional aspects in addition to the importance uh, of the topic itself. Over the past two years, KFUBM has gone through an important transformation. Uh, it has created uh, an entirely new structure for its undergraduate programs based on a digital foundation that we call the Artificial Intelligence Plus X platform, where every student uh, becomes a specialist in artificial intelligence in addition to their fields. And hence, we introduced uh, university requirements in courses in artificial intelligence, data science, advanced computing in Python, and also business and entrepreneurship and career essentials and others. We created a plethora of new uh, sub-disciplines that we call the concentrations in exciting topics. Uh, some of them I mentioned, artificial intelligence. Some of them uh, include things like hydrogen mobility, quantum computing, uh, non-metallic uh, materials, and so on. And they span almost every discipline in the university. We also created 32 new uh, graduate degrees in the form of Master of Engineering degrees in similar topics. Also, KFUBM over the last two years has admitted females uh, for the first time on a meritorious basis to its graduate programs that we created. And this year, admitted them also to the undergraduate program, which is a historic uh, event for the university since it didn't have uh, half of society since its inception in 1963. The university is moving very quickly and very rapidly, and it is gaining recognition. Uh, we are now ranked number 163 in the QS Global University rankings, and in, especially in some disciplines, we are number seven globally in petroleum engineering, 14 in minerals and mining, number 16 in chemical engineering, number 84 in electrical engineering, number 98 in civil and structural engineering, and so on. And this is something we are proud of. Some of these disciplines made uh, advancements of as big as 30 to 40 to 50 positions in the span of two years. Uh, so we are moving forward. We are maintaining our focus on the journey of becoming an international, globally recognized university, on becoming a hub that would disseminate knowledge to everybody and that would attract knowledge from all over the globe, the, the, that would be a hub for attracting talent into our faculty, into our graduate uh, assistants, and into our students. So next year, we will start admitting international students into our undergraduate uh, program. And most importantly, that we are a university that does things with the objective of making an impact on improving society. And nothing can be more important than to society than having access to water, especially clean water that can be consumed uh, in a healthy manner. And that would be the basis. Uh, for prosperous life all over the world. I'd like to thank you again for your participation and wish you and everybody attending uh, this meeting a very uh, useful, a very uh, informative and very enjoyable event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Um... Well, a word of thank you. I should uh, uh, say thank you to the president for his uh, continuous support, uh, not only for our center, but all uh, the centers. In addition, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Mohammed Yassin for organizing the program this today, and also for uh, KFUPM Institute of Knowledge and Exchange for their logistics uh, uh, support. Uh, since we have uh, a few minutes uh, right here uh, before uh, Dr. Su can uh, start his uh, presentation, I will take this opportunity to introduce the uh, center. If you allow me to uh, share screen, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, yes, please. I will be 
leaving you to conduct the event because I'm committed to other things. But I wish you a very, very uh, uh, enjoyable event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, just a uh, real quick uh, introduction to our uh, uh, center. Our center uh, mission is to pursue solutions for local and global challenges, uh, to commercialize uh, research output and to provide superior educational research experience for students and researchers. We are targeting uh, several sectors, including the oil and gas, mining, um, wastewater treatment, desalination, energy, environment, and agriculture. We receive funds from the university, and we also uh, get funds from uh, uh, projects, external uh, uh, projects. Uh, now we have uh, several departments involved in the center, chemistry, chemical engineering, civil engineering, petroleum engineering, environmental science, mechanical engineering, biology, physics, and even social sciences. Uh, we are trying to uh, tackle some of the challenges such as the groundwater depletion, fouling resistant membranes, organic solvent membranes, produced water, uh, brine mining, and scaling up. For the center, we have four themes, uh, including the water security, water treatment, desalination, and membranes. Uh, for the water security, we are trying to build capacity and tackle some of the uh, trending topics such as uh, water resources uh, development, planning and management, climate change and water, scarcity, groundwater, uh, uh, sustainability, and uh, other issues such as remote uh, sensing. Uh, we have uh, collaborators outside the, um, the university such as Saudi Aramco, uh, Saline Water Convergent uh, Corporation, the world's largest uh, desalination company. Uh, in addition to the Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture, Saudi Irrigation Organization, and a few universities such as the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And today we just uh, uh, talked to people in the uh, uh, National uh, um, Technology um, uh, Techno uh, the na uh, National Technology of Singapore. Uh, we talked to, uh, to them and she presented uh, uh, their uh, views about uh, their uh, research and uh, we will shall reach to uh, an agreement with them. Uh, that's it for uh, me, Dr. Mohammed. If you want to introduce uh, the uh, first guest, please. Uh, Dr. Declan Bell. Uh, Dr. Declan Bell uh, is a principal scientist in uh, groundwater system research team at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, Australia. Uh, prior to uh, CSIRO, uh, Dr. Bell spent uh, several years working in water utilities, consulting, and international uh, business development in Indonesia and Thailand. He is an inter international research leader in uh, water banking, water recycling, and storm water reuse via aquifers uh, with professional experience in human health risk assessment, water quality, and tre treatment. He has been the group leader of several uh, large projects, uh, work in China, uh, India, Chile, Germany, and Oman, and received many achievements and award. He has published uh, over 100 high quality publi uh, publication in water quality management, water supply, uh, natural uh, treatment system, water uh, recycling, and reuse, and many aquifer recharge. Dr. Declan Bed hold PhD degree in chemical technology from University of South uh, Australia and the Master uh, of Business Administration from uh, Monash University. Uh, uh, please uh, 
uh, with this, uh, I will give the floor uh, to Dr. Declan uh, to present uh, for us his uh, topic. So that feel free, Dr. Declan, to uh, share your presentation. Okay, could you confirm that you can see my presentation? Yes, it's clear. Sorry, it's, it's not quite the start. There we are. Thank you firstly to um, Dr. Zias Yasin and Dr. Hassan um, for the invite, the opportunity to speak today. Also to the university for hosting this excellent forum. My name is uh, Declan Page and I work for the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, which is the Federal Research Agency of the Australian Government. Much like Saudi Arabia, Australia is also a very arid content, uh, continent. And um, I'm gonna be speaking about um, Managed Act for Recharge and Sustainable Urban Water Management, which is my passion. Um, I think it's very applicable to many of the countries in the Middle East region as well. So, firstly, for those of you who don't know, Managed Act for Recharge, also called MAR, it's also called things like groundwater replenishment or artificial recharge. And it's an, it's an umbrella term used for a range of methods to intentionally recharge aquifers for beneficial use or for environmental protection. It's been increasing, it's been used in Australia since about the 1960s. Um, it's used all over the world these days, but increasingly it's being used now in the urban space as well with um, alternate waters. And that's really gonna be a focus of my talk today is use of non-traditional waters such as urban stormwater and wastewater and how they, can, they, along with aquifers, can contribute to sustainable urban water management. In general, there's lots of different ways to get the water into the underground, into an aquifer. And you can see on the right-hand side of this screen, um, all sorts of different methods um, of getting the water in. That depends largely on where you're based and the hydrogeology of the area, but there are two main methods. Firstly is what's known as well injection methods. Typically it's used for deeper aquifers, um, tend to be more expensive, um, but you can target again, much deeper aquifers and confined aquifers. Cheaper methods using infiltration basins, which can be like large ponds or um, just basins or canals. And they, they target the shallow aquifers and tend to be cheaper. The exact method you'll use will depend again, largely on the situation, the geology and hydrogeology and what sort of water sources you have. Um, but they all share the common idea that you take water when it's available from the surface, inject it or recharge it into the subsurface into an aquifer and then recover it again when it's needed. By having this extra water in the aquifer, of course, that contributes to um, more storage, potentially a higher resilience and greater water security. So what are the benefits of, of managed aquifer recharge? There are quite a few. So this increased storage, is, as I said before, is greater water security. Um, in times of climate change, of course, that's increasingly seen as a high value, high value thing. They reduce the need for new dams. By recharging the existing groundwater, um, we, they're often called underground dams as well, because it, these are largely like dams that don't need to be built. Often again, groundwater systems are already over, over extracted or over exploited. And we heard from, I think it was from Dr. Hassan earlier that many of the Saudi Arabian groundwater systems are also, also in, um, have historically been mined. And so MAR presents a method or managed act for recharge, a way to recharge these systems and bring them back into equilibrium. Um, it offers an opportunity to maximize the value of alternate waters. So things like stormwater and wastewater traditionally seen as waste products in the urban space, can now be recycled, stored, and then used again when it's required. This is especially important for um, uh, areas, uh, global areas that have a high seasonality, so a distinct wet and dry season. Another advantage of using aquifers um, for storage is they provide a form of treatment. So often um, lower quality waters, such as treated wastewater, um, can be stored in aquifer and the natural processes that occur, things like degradation of 
of um, organic chemicals, attenuation of pathogens, human pathogens like viruses or bacteria, protozoa, occur naturally over time and thereby improve the water quality prior to release. And it is through this filtration process in the aquifer that the waters, um, that these alternate waters can be treated. And really a, a really promising line of research these days is this hybrid system between engineered and natural treatment systems. Additionally, um, an advantage is it's generally quite low cost, um, unlike some other sort of water systems when you talk to, people talk about desalination being high energy, a lot of these can be quite low energy, especially the infiltration schemes where water is simply infiltrated into an aquifer and then allowed to, um, allowed to sort of naturalize or, um, or improve in quality. Speaking of naturalization and a really important point when it comes to stakeholder engagement, especially when we're talking about water reuse, is this concept of, um, well, it's often called in Australia, we call it the yuck factor. And that's where people don't, don't take kindly necessarily to wanting to um, uh, reuse water or wastewater. And so by, by putting the water into an aquifer, now often for, for years at a time, it allows for a naturalization and greater stakeholder um, acceptance of those sort of systems. An important area, important point for saline areas, so, sorry, um, coastal areas is if um, water is injected into aquifers, it can form a saline intrusion barrier and thereby prevent salinization of coastal aquifers. Lastly, um, second lastly, um, where, the, where there are groundwater dependent ecosystems, there's an opportunity to help sustain them into, into the future. But probably one of the biggest advantages in an arid, arid area is you have minimised things like evaporation, growth of nuisance algae, and of course, mosquitoes, which can be problematic in many parts of the world and carry disease. So there's quite a few benefits, I guess, compared to new dams new dams versus aquifers. Now, aquifers aren't the same in every city, I, I know that, um, we, and it will depend largely on, some cities are blessed with very easy to use aquifers and some unfortunately don't have the same um, quality aquifers, but where they have, they can be quite advantageous over dam sites. I'd stress this isn't a solution for every city. It is a solution that can be used as part of a portfolio of options um, for some cities. They can be beneficial because if you look, new dam sites, often have the problem they use prime productive valley floor areas, can displace large amounts of people. And um, we heard before from I think it was Dr. Yassin about um, the environmental impacts of dams as well, especially on downstream users where groundwater recharge might be affected. They tend to be quite distant from cities. So longer pipes, more energy and, and more pumping is required. However, the big advantage of this of course, they're very large, they can store quite a lot of water. Aquifers, though, have certain advantages. Um, they tend to be very close to sources of water. So, for example, if you're looking at urban stormwater or wastewater, these tend to be quite plentiful in cities. There's typically no land lost. Um, again, the aquifers already exist beneath our, beneath our feet, and they provide storage and a potentially treatment of these waters prior to recovery. There's low energy costs, fairly low capital costs as well in setting up these systems. And there's no operation out of your mosquitoes. Really important is also is that they're great for, I guess, incremental storage. So schemes can be built up quite slowly. You can inject small amounts of water, creating a bubble of the water you want to recover, and then slowly over the years, create this sort of strategic reserve of water. This is increasingly being done for cities all around the world. Here you see a schematic of, of the types of schemes I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. Um, this is called an aquifer storage and recovery scheme where water is injected via an aquifer down into a well into a, into a subsurface aquifer, um, sorry, a, a confined aquifer and then recovered again for reuse. Now there are all different sorts of configurations that can be put together for these sorts of schemes. Um, and I quote, and I, I stress, sorry, so these are examples only, really. All different sorts of source waters can be used from mains water, desalinated water, reclaimed water, storm water, rural runoff, or even different types of groundwater. They need to be captured, sometimes need to be treated prior to injection, they're recharged, and finally, the commonality between all of this is stored in aquifer before it's recovered, potentially treated again, and used for different end uses. And again, these are all just examples. 
But all of those have been implemented to some degree. And I'm going to take you through a couple of the examples, mostly from my own experience in Australia, a few others also from around the world. So lastly, the thing that people always ask is what, what sort of aquifers are favourable and what aren't? Which ones aren't for aquifer storage and recovery? Generally, we, we want large regional aquifers that are very permeable, nice and thick, so they can store lots of water, nice hydraulic properties and um, uniform gradients. Um, fresh water is preferred because obviously if you, if you inject fresh water into a, a sail on a brackish aquifer, quite a lot can, can be lost due to mixing. Um, ideally, you want to have unreactive minerals there, so not too much, for example, pyrite, which could release arsenic into the water. Um, if it's in warmer waters, um, things like pathogens and organic chemicals will break down faster. And if it's confined, of course, you would um, minimise, for example, in a city, the effects, the effects of land use above. So pollution, for example, from leaking sewers or historical uses um, of, the, of the city above the aquifer can be protected if we have a confined aquifer, that is a confining clay layer above where you're keeping water. So I'll give you now some examples of urban stormwater managed aquifer recharge or MAR as we like to call it here. So first a little bit about the water cycle. Now, apologize for a graph. I'm gonna show this graph twice in fact. But we have a, a very seasonality between a wet season and a dry season followed by a wet season again. Demand for water tends to be the opposite of when it's raining, which is pretty obvious. Um, low demand during the wet season, a really high demand during the dry season and then low demand again. That's the exact opposite of usually when um, stormwater is, is, a, is available. So usually we have a lot of stormwater to get rid of, which is drained off the ocean during the wet season, when it's not needed. None available during the dry season and it's available again. Um, so the idea is we, we wanna move that, I guess this available water up to here where the demand is noted move it through time, potentially through space as well, so that we have the stormwater stored during the, um, during the wet season for use during the dry season. It's the complete opposite of what, effort, what we do with, for example, treated wastewater, which is quite uniform in its, in its volumes produced by city through most of the year. So here we have an example of an urban stormwater system. This is from, uh, I live in a town called Adelaide, south of um, Australia, capital of South Australia. This is an urban area to the north here in the middle of winter. It's nice and green. It's not always that green. We have a number of um, urban wetlands here where water is harvested from the, from the surrounding um, suburbs. It goes through a number of wetlands. Um, those form those sort of natural treatment systems or nature-based solutions. We heard that term before. And then they're injected after, after first going through the wetlands into an ASI well or aquifer storage and recovery well prior to being recovered again uh, for use for green space irrigation. One of the advantages of some of those some of those systems is many of the suburbs then have their own, you could say, strategic water storage for use for irrigation during summer when we might be suffering from things like water restrictions in parts of Australia. So these research projects, they're quite, they were quite pioneering at the time. Um, and they really gave us a lot of outcomes in terms of what did they produce. They showed us that, I mean, the value of a good research project and a well-run demonstration project is they really catalyze, I guess, the uptake of this sort of technology. At least when we did in Australia back in 96, which is now nearly 25 years ago, we were able to prove that water could be injected, stored, and then recovered over a number of years. It could be done cheaply, the, the water quality would be acceptable. And it also then spurred the, I guess the growth of, of policy and regulation and interest by regulatory authorities to adopt this, this technology more widely. And you can see here, um, we then moved that, we then moved I guess, the type of configuration again, using urban stormwater. You can see on the left-hand side, here's a drainage canal. It's typically got algae growing in it during winter. And again, it's passed through wetland. You can see the example wetland here. Um, where people are sampling for water quality. Um, and it's, it's with the Phragmites uh, reads there. Well, then passes through the wetland. It's injected into an injection well. But the important difference is it is then recovered through a different well. So the water actually has to travel 
50 metres through the aquifer before being recovered. Uh, we did a fair bit of work on things like modelling to show sort of the density gradient, because this was injected actually into a saline aquifer or a brackish aquifer. So this, we had to control things like mixing to make sure that the water recovered was sufficiently fresh. It was then um, recovered and finally treated and bottled to prove that we could produce drinking water quality. It was, oh, I seem to be missing a slide here. Maybe not. Oh, importantly, being urban stormwater, um, land uses can have a quite a big impact on quality. So you need to be, have a good risk management plan and processes in place. You know, things like industrial sectors, horticulture, even mining for things like sand and um, aggregates here in Adelaide and the, the north. And I guess understanding what sort of hazards might exist in water and affect your water quality is important for managing the quality of, this, of the final system. Ultimately, for those of you who know anything about Australian politics, you'll notice here on the right is one of our Australian Prime Ministers. Um, and we were able to show that you could take urban stormwater, that's this water here flowing down the road, inject it 200 metres below the ground, move it 50 metres again across ground, and those natural processes and filtration were enough to improve the quality sufficient that with a little bit more further treatment, in this case chlorination, just to guarantee the safety, we're able to produce water that's suitable for drinking. We reduced a number of bottles of water, which we called recharge. And I guess it was a very good opportunity to, um, there's nothing like an actual physical product when it's talking to politicians and the like to really show engagement and um, facilitate adoption of, the, of this sort of type of technology. So again, this has now been, um, been rolled out across many other other states and states and towns in Australia. Um, this is an example from Melbourne here. Stormwater harvesting gain for a um, uh, uh, sorry for a, I lost my I lost my place uh, for a golf course. In this case, it was a very much more difficult to use aquifer. It used ultra filtration and granular activated carbon filtration. The extra extra high level of um, treatment was required because the aquifer was very difficult to get the water into. It was very, a very tight formation. However, nevertheless, the golf course was able to harvest the urban stormwater, inject it and recover it and use it for irrigation. This was particularly important at the time because um, Australia was in the middle of a drought, it was around the year 2000, and there was no water available for irrigation of golf courses. So if they didn't, weren't able to manufacture their own water somehow, they would go dry. So in this case, it saved the golf course. Important point. The point I want to show is sort of like these things like infiltration basins. This is an example from the township of Perth. They can be quite small in, in size as well. They don't all have to be large, quite technical affairs. This is an infiltration basin. Um, you can see the water, um, stormwater from the car park overflows into, the, into these streams and just infiltrates into the aquifer. And Perth in the, in the west of Australia gets most of its water from groundwater. And so any, I guess, opportunity to help recharge, even in a distributed way like this, assists in maintaining a balance, let's say, between um, extraction and dem demand and um, demand and recharge. Lastly, here's another example from, from a new one from Melbourne as well. And again, increasingly, the hydraulics of towns and cities are, are changing and many of the old, I guess, ways of managing stormwater are being replaced by these sort of type of rain gardens or what's called a wusset or water sensitive urban design and thereby um, again promoting recharge of the aquifer rather than conveyance of, the, of an otherwise waste product to the ocean. It's not to say Australia's the only person to do it. Some of the greatest examples are actually from places like Africa. This is the Atlantis system in South Africa where large amounts of water are also infiltrated into these basins. And this, in these examples is for drinking water. So we're not alone there. I'd like to give you a couple of quick examples of recycled water managed aquifer recharge as well. Now, much like I said before, um, when demand, demand may oscillate through the year, however, effluent, treated effluent, the green line is almost stable in the amount produced every, uh, produced throughout the year. So it performs a, a nice steady source. And so it's again, moving that water from when it's when it's um for when it's produced to when it's needed. Here's an example again from my hometown of 
uh, called the Bolivar Aqua Storage Recovery Trial, which secondary treated wastewater is um, injected into an aqua storage recovery well. Here again, about 200 meters deep in a saline brackish aquifer. Mixing can be controlled because there's different density of water probably below the, below the surface, about again, 200 meters below ground. And then recovered again to the pumping station for um, urban green space irrigation, as well as horticulture. In this case, supplying much of the water that goes to Virginia, um, Virginia area, which produces many of the fruits and vegetables and table, table grapes for the township of Adelaide. In a nutshell, this is, this is how, how it looks. Again, um, water, wastewater from the city goes through a treatment, uh, treatment plant, some post-treatment required um, prior to, which would normally go to ocean, ocean discharge. But in this case, during summer, it can go straight to irrigation, but in winter, excess is stored when there's, a, I guess, a, um, um, there's not enough demand from the irrigation systems. And then um, the excess water is, the stored water is then recovered during summer, um, again, for uh, irrigation. And that way we help meet some of the urban demand and also reduce, um, I guess, demand from things like surface water systems, which are usually already quite over allocated. Here you can see it's been going on for a number of years. Um, and different amounts of water available, of course, each year. And you can see it works almost like what's called water bank. And this is why it's also often called water cycle, um, water, sorry, um, water banking. So this shows the amount of volumes that, that can be these injected over a number of days since the trial. And generally, you can get some water in each year. Um, you can see cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. And then sometimes water is stored. Some water can be lost due to mixing before it's recovered. And optimization of this recharge storage recovery cycle is key to maximizing the benefits from those systems. Probably the most famous system is one over in Western Australia. The township there um, of Perth, which is the capital of Western Australia, several million people, receives about 20% of its water from recycled water managed for recharge. Here water is taken. Um, they have a number of desalination plants also, but they found it was cheaper to take water from, from the treated wastewater treat it to a very high standard, and that's using ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, UV and advanced oxidation before injecting into an aquifer for recovery. The nice thing about this one is that it takes about 50 years from the point of injection to the point of recovery. So the water takes 50, takes 50 years to travel about three kilometers before the water is recovered, put back into the system and put into the drinking water supply where it's treated again, much like normal water. As I mentioned earlier in my slides, this has been a key factor in getting public support because it's no longer seen as treated wastewater and largely just seen as, as groundwater by, by that stage. Um, it's been a success and um, yeah, they're, they're looking at 28 gigalitres, producing 28 gigalitres per year of water now from these schemes. So again, there's, there's many different ways to get the water in there. This is an example of, a, of an infiltration basin. These are a series of canals or galleries using what's called Atlantis crates. So they don't have to be 200 metres deep. There can be different aquifers to be targeted under the same city. And this is again in Perth. And here wastewater is recharged, not treated to such a high standard, but it's only recovered for irrigation. So again, it's used for parks and ovals and, and yeah, green space irrigation. Here's an example from the Arid Centre. This is from um, the township of Alice Springs. Here we have an infiltration basin. They had a lot of excess water um, from their wastewater treatment plant, and they had a problem with mosquitoes. So they could no longer simply discharge it to the river and had to look at infiltrating to manage both the mosquito problem and the associated problem with dengue fever disease. So this water, they built a specialized water treatment plant um, to help with the irrigation, but also to um, assist with management of things like clogging. So these schemes can reduce in hydraulic capacity as they are used over time, especially through things like growth of algae or um, um, if suspended solid, solids are, um, uh, are high in the water or, or growth of biofilms. But these waters um, are actually then recharged into the aquifer and recovered subsequently for, for irrigation. And again, in places like Alice Springs, we're not as dry as Saudi Arabia, it's still pretty dry by our standards. Again, we're not the only ones. Places like Africa have also done a lot of work in this space. And again, um, using secondary treated wastewater 
um, for recharging their aquifers. You can see here again from the Atlanta system. The nice thing about their system is they use both stormwater and wastewater together, mixed together um, as a combined system, which I think really will be the future. Is looking at many different tool sources of water quality, recharging different water qualities, and recovering again for specific end uses. See another example here of the sort of size and scope there. This is again a large scale municipal system uh, from South Africa. And these are the infiltration basins currently when they're dry, these are normally filled with water when they're infiltrating. Okay, I've got a couple of concluding remarks. So <clears throat> What's the role of managed act for recharge in a sustainable urban water management? Well, it's largely to harvest unused water. So these are alternate waters that have traditionally been discharged to the ocean and thereby degrading the marine environment. They store these waters and provide a new source of water quality suitable for, for its desired needs. So in Australia, we're lucky we have quite, we have, I think, good regulations in terms of it's very risk-based. So um, waters aren't all treated to the same standard. Drinking water has a very high standard of treatment, whereas things like irrigation water have a lower standard. That of course frees up um, things like cost and ensures that water is fit for purpose. Often aquifers are actually, in urban areas are actually the cheapest storages available. They're generally free, they sit below our feet, and you only have to pay for access. If you compare that to things like um, building above ground tanks, they are very, very much cheaper. As a bonus, aquifers act as a biogeochemical reactors. They treat this water as it's, as it's stored under there. The process of moving water underground and just time, absorption of pathogens onto, onto mineral faces, um, all, all contribute to improving water quality. And I guess importantly, recharge waters can include all sorts of, sort of, any sorts of urban waters that might be available. It could be stormwater, reclaimed water, it could be mains water, even, even in some countries, desalinated water is used when, it's, when there's excess to demand because of the difficulties in turning these sort of schemes on and off. We also use things like groundwater from other aquifers. If you have, might have a shallow aquifer that floods momentarily or is full, leading to water logging, that aquifer can be drained and stored in a deeper aquifer to allow for greater storage. So thank you, everybody. Um, that concludes my talk. And... Yeah, I'm open to any questions or, or any um, comments from anyone. Thank you, Dr. Declan, for the uh, fruitful presentation. Actually, we have one question from uh, Sultan. He asked about, I would like to ask about, uh, I can read it for you. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, Austerian, Austerian public uh, concern on city recycled water and being treated treated and reused as drinking or uh, city regular use. Regular use. Uh, has this been any of Australian concern open the whole uh, ecology? Yes. I, I, um, ideology? I read, Sorry. I read the question as well. Um, okay. Yes, it's been a massive concern. So it might seem easy here, but this is 25 years of, of research that's been going on here. It's not something that we did in, in a couple of years. Um, people are very nervous about um, drinking recycled water or having, having anything to do with recycled water or stormwater. Often people worry about disease and of course organic chemicals and pesticides. And if you look at the sort of water that rushes down in a stormwater system, it doesn't look very clean. So we've had an, I guess nothing, there's nothing like a good drought really to really push innovation in water management, is what we say. So we had a large, what's called the Federation drought in Australia it was almost 10 years of drought. And by that time, when there's enough water restrictions um, and enough investment in research and, and good quality, I guess, things like these sort of demonstration sites, public um, can be educated and eventually accept these sort of schemes. And in places like Perth now, it's certainly seen as preferred option compared to things like desalination, which also have, have their associated costs and benefits. I mean, there's things like brine disposal problems for inland water for desalination. And of course, the high energy use now and COP26 coming up. That, I mean, that there are trade-offs with all these things. Um, there's a certain proportion of the population you may never, ever convince, even with all the data in the world, but a good research project where you're able to show that this water is treated to beyond a drinking water standard for many, for, for drinking water, or at least to a safe standard for the type of use. So 
but it'd be that irrigation or industrial use. So yes, it is a problem. Um, not a, well, it is a concern that, that has been raised and it's largely been addressed in the Australian context now and water cycling is very much accepted as a necessity to meet the, um, to meet the climate change challenges of the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For the quantity of uh, water uh, could be a store. Uh, this depends on what the quantity, how many meet, cubic meter per hour and yeah, store it. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the nice thing is these many of these schemes can be scalable. So you can start small, inject more and more water over time, create this large storage, and then recover it when you need it. So some of the schemes can be quite large. For example, the one in Shadow in Perth is about 28 gigalitres. It's 20% of the supply of a town of 2 million people. Um, whereas others can be in the range of megalitres or metres, even kilolitres, depending. So I know people who have them in their backyards where they recover water from their roof, put it through a tank, and then recharge it and again reuse it. Um, the, the, amount, the volumes that can be used would depend on a number of things. Generally, the amount of water you can have available for recharge would be a, a major constraint, but it can also be the aquifer. So some aquifers can be difficult to get the water into the aquifer quick enough. That's often the largest hydraulic constraint is how quickly can you recharge water into aquifers. I haven't, I haven't talked today about our work with, um, for example, flood, flood waters, because this was largely focused more on um, uh, urban waters. But in those examples, yeah, very large scale, large quantities of water can be stored potentially in our big um, Murray-Darling Basin up to about four kilometres cubic. It's a lot of water. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Declare. Uh, actually, uh, now let us uh, go to the third uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim. Uh, let me introduce uh, him. Jim is a professor of hydrogeology at the Technical University of uh, Valencia, Spain, and he is responsible for uh, the group of hydrogeology at the Institute of Water and uh, Environmental Engineering. He received his uh, PhD degree on geostatistics uh, from Stanford University. His main research uh, deal with the character characterization and modeling of the subsurface. Uh, uh, Jaime has uh, devoted his career to the, to the analysis of heterogeneity in the subsurface and the way to, uh, to mitigate the lack of knowledge uh, resulting from the sparse, uh, sparse uh, observation. He uh, awarded uh, Prince Sultan uh, bin Abdulaziz International uh, Prize. With this, I will give the floor uh, to uh, Dr. Jaime uh, to present his uh, presentation under the title, The Importance of Modeling Hydraulic Conductivity uh, Heterogeneity. So that's the floor for you, Dr. Jaime. You can share your screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... I will, I will not be sh sharing anything. I will just uh, be projecting the slides on, on uh, my back. So okay. if you just pin my, uh, my, uh, basically my video, you will see uh, everything. Uh, His Excellency, Dr. al Sagaf, uh, Director Dr. Hassan, uh, Organizer Dr. Yassin, thanks uh, uh, very much for this uh, invitation uh, to participate uh, in this uh, forum. I will be uh, talking, as uh, uh, Dr. Jessin mentioned, about the importance of uh, modern hydraulic conductivity heterogeneity in this uh, water security technical forum organized uh, by the Center of Membranes and Water Security. Um, before I say that, uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you that I, I, I am the, the 2021 Distinguished Lecturer for the International Association of Mathematical Geosciences. And, uh, and this lecture is, is part of the, of the theoretical tour that I, I should have been given uh, thanks to this uh, award, but uh, that has uh, become just a, a virtual tour uh, that allowed me to give a few talks, uh, uh, but uh, not in person, uh, uh, just uh, using the Zoom platform. The 
association that uh, that uh, gave me this distinction is is a, is a worldwide association with more than 800 members. You have uh, this QR code right there that uh, will uh, discharge some uh, information, more detailed information about the association, which uh, aims is to promote the advancement and of mathematics, statistics, and information informatics in the geoscience. It was founded in 1968 uh, at the 23rd International Geological Congress in Prague. Since then, it has been uh, publishing a number of uh, journals. Uh, the, 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 the landmark, I mean, the one that it's uh, most uh, important is this Mathematical Geoscience, published since uh, 1968, uh, uh, since the, the GRF Foundations. But there are uh, there are three other three other uh, journals that uh, uh, we publish, which is Computer and Geoscience, Natural Resources Research and applied computing, computing and geoscience. And besides that, we have this uh, newsletter, which is published uh, by GRLE, by the association. I mean, uh, if uh, you are not a member or you don't, you don't know the association, I, I, I certainly uh, incite you to, to visit the web page and, and uh, know what we are doing, try to publish in our, in our journals and, uh, and maybe join the association. The, 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 the fee for the joining is, is, very, is very small. But uh, let's get into the into the the, the topic of my talk. Uh, this uh, treatment of hydraulic conductivity heterogeneity it will be a little bit more technical than the previous two uh, two talks. But uh, both of them uh, either explicitly or implicitly mention uh, the importance of heterogeneity. Uh, in the previous one, I mean, the heterogeneity of the aquifer was clearly uh, a matter of concern when doing this uh, managed aquifer recharge. Uh, uh, and certainly involves uh, a complexity that uh, may uh, difficult or, or may, may may require further analysis uh, to, to uh, start this uh, this managed recharge. And uh, and I was very glad to see the Hooker River, uh, I mean no, the, the Hooker River, the, the Mancha Oriental Aquifer uh, example presented by Dr. Su as, as an application of engineering activities to solve. Uh, hydrogeological problems, in this case, uh, aquifer depletion, depletion. I'm very proud to see that uh, he used uh, two figures from uh, our hydrolink paper that was published just uh, a couple of years uh, ago. But uh, let me talk about heterogeneity. What, what I mean by, by trying to characterize heterogeneity, the, the problem we have with uh, the subsurface, the problem we have with uh, modeling aquifers is that we don't know what's uh, underground. Uh, we, we, we may drill a few wells and we, we may know uh, I mean, a little bit what, uh, what's uh, there, but uh, in general, I mean, you have, we have very limited information about uh, the underground. And, uh, and, and only in very, in very specific cases, like uh, in this case, which is, uh, uh, we are looking at, uh, at, at a section in the Hunter Valley called Open Pit Mine, in uh, uh, in Australia, uh, we can actually see what uh, what the what the aquifer may look like. Uh, here we have this cross section, and we see exactly how uh, the material the, that makes up the aquifer uh, well is is organized uh, in a in a in a order way, but at the same way in a, in a, in a chaotic way. Okay, we have order in this case. This is a sedimentary basin. It's a sedimentary uh, uh, geology. Uh, where you have your sediments uh, nicely aligned, but it's not, they are not perfectly aligned. And, and we see that uh, they are not perfectly homogeneous in each one of these uh, layers that is uh, heterogeneity. And just for reference, <clears throat> I put uh, the image of a crane there, uh, one of these big cranes from the mine. So you can imagine that this cross section may be 100 or 150 meters uh, uh, in height. So, so this is what, uh, uh, the aquifer may look like, but what we see when we drill a couple of wells is uh, the information that you can see on through these two slits. That's uh, that's all, and from that uh, we, we 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 need to gather all the information uh, necessary to build a model that uh, will then uh, allow us to know how the aquifer will res respond to uh, a potential in in injection of water for, for this uh, uh, managed aqu aquifer recharge, or if there are some uh, contamination spill, how the spill is going to uh, evolve uh, in the aquifer. Sometimes we are lucky and uh, we don't have direct information, but uh, sometimes it's uh, indirect information like uh, some geophysical data, uh, like this uh, seismic survey that uh, uh, that you see here, 
the seismic survey will give you uh, qualitative information about some of the properties of the aquifer. Uh, in this case, well, okay, you can see the, the layer in, uh, in the aquifer. You have the two wells where you can contrast uh, the, what has been seen in the, in the survey and what uh, uh, is uh, uh, actually measured uh, in the aquifer. So you can calibrate uh, your geophysics, uh, but this is uh, at the end is, is qualitative information. I mean, you have to, uh, to treat it with uh, the uncertainty associated with the fact that this is not measuring directly uh, the properties of interest uh, of the aquifer. So uh, again, I put back uh, the, this image. We want to characterize this type of heterogeneity uh, with uh, limited information. And uh, before going into the characterization, which I, I will I will talk about uh, on the on the latest part of the presentation, I, I just want to show you. I mean, which is uh, which is this impact of heterogeneity in a few uh, cases that we have modeled uh, numerically. In this case, what I'm showing you is uh, how a plume evolves in an aquifer with uh, different degrees of heterogeneity. You can see on the top is homogeneous and uh, heterogeneity increases as we move uh, uh, downwards. The, the water is flowing in the, in the aquifer from left to right. And you see that, I mean, if, if you model uh, the aquifer as homogeneous and the aquifer has a heterogeneity with a high variability, like uh, say the third row, which has a log conductivity variance of one, which is not very high, you can see that, I mean, the, the plume is going to evolve in a very, very different uh, way. Uh, and it's not going, I mean, uh, if you use some more, a homogeneous model to try to try to predict how the uh, contamination moves in the aquifer, um, uh, you are not going to get uh, a good uh, prediction of what's uh, happening and you may try to claim the, uh, reclaim the aquifer, but uh, you are going to, uh, to fail because uh, you actually don't know exactly where the, the plume is. Some one uh, which is uh, more involved in, in aquifer modeling may say, okay, but when we use a homogeneous aquifer, we introduce a macro dispersion coefficient that is derived from the heterogeneity of the aquifer, and that will basically mimic, mimic what's happening uh, in, in reality. Well, it's true that when you use this macro dispersion model in which uh, you introduce an additional parameter in your homogeneous model, you get something that is getting a little bit closer to reality in the sense that the, the dispersion uh, induced by the heterogeneity is, is uh, introduced in the modeling, but the homogeneous model is still too far from the actual uh, uh, behavior of the heterogeneous uh, uh, case that, uh, that that you see on the you have seen on the left uh, on the left side. And let me show you just one final example. This is a, a reclamation uh, exercise. Imagine that there is an area that has been contaminated, which could be this square area. And then on the left, uh, we uh, consider that the aquifer is heterogeneous, not very heterogeneous. And on the right, you consider that the aquifer is homogeneous. You are pumping from the, from the blue uh, well, from the blue dot in the center. And, and you can see that on the homogeneous, you can, you can dream of reclaiming the aquifer. You can, it, it seems that, I mean, if you pump uh, uh, enough water for a long enough time, you will be able to basically extract all the contamination uh, from the aquifer. But, but the truth is that uh, uh, if you have a little bit of heterogeneity, that is not going to happen. And that's uh, the reason why many pump and treat uh, systems have not uh, worked, have not uh, succeeded, that, uh, because they they, they build the system assuming that the uh, uh, aquifer is homogeneous, but then the reality is that, that uh, the aquifer, uh, aquifers are not homogeneous, that there is some degree of heterogeneity always. So most of the, of the work I have done, and, and in fact, I mean, the reason why I received this uh, Prince bin Sultan uh, Abdulazid uh, price of water is uh, for my work on, on inverse modeling. And inverse modeling, what we are trying to do is basically to characterize the aquifer from the information we have, uh, from the little information we have, to try to get the best model of the aquifer so that we can make the best prediction of, of how this, uh, uh, this contamination plume uh, moves uh, in the aquifer. And, uh, and I'm going to show you uh, a couple of examples, no, well, just one example, uh, sorry, of uh, the application of inverse model, inverse modeling uh, uh, for contaminant source identification. 
basically what we are doing in inverse modeling is just gathering information. Uh, like it could be, say, measuring the hydraulic heads, so measuring the, the concentration at a few wells uh, in the aquifer, and try to infer the hydraulic conductivities and maybe the porosities, uh, the parameters of the aquifer, which are difficult to, uh, to measure, which are heterogeneous and which are driving, uh, driving the behavior of, uh, of the aquifer. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a, an example of forensic hydrogeology in the sense that uh, uh, what I will be showing you is uh, a case of uh, contaminant source uh, identification. Uh, the, uh, the data available will be concentration breakthrough curves at a few sampling locations. And from those uh, breakthrough curves at those locations, we are going to try to uh, characterize to, to DDI, which is the underlying distribution or spatial distribution of hydraulic conductivity, which is, as I said, the, the parameter that is driving the, the movement. Uh, what we are going to identify is uh, we are going to identify where the concentration was dumped in the, uh, into the aquifer, when it was dumped, I mean, which was the duration of the concentration, and at the same time, which is the spatial distribution of the hydraulic conductivity. Mm -hmm. A very important problem in, in forensic uh, hydrogeology, uh, especially, uh, especially in, in, in groundwater, because uh, sometimes you may detect uh, that your well has been contaminated uh, way later, I mean, much later than uh, it happened. I mean, the event happened, and, and when you try to, to find responsibilities, uh, then, I mean, you, you don't have uh, the information about who or where the, the dumping might have happened. We did a, a laboratory experiment. Uh, we built a heterogeneous uh, aquifer in a sandbox. Uh, here you see, uh, yes, some of my students uh, building this uh, sandbox. Uh, this was done actually in, uh, in an aquifer, in a laboratory in, at Parma University where we have a very good uh, relationship. Uh, the uh, sandbox is built with two types of uh, glass bits, uh, some which are very conductive and uh, other ones which are uh, low conductivity uh, sand bits. And uh, well, after uh, uh, several hours, I mean, it took some time, we uh, ended up with this uh, distribution of uh, high uh, conductivities, the blue ones, and low conductivities, which would be these uh, brownish ones. Uh, this will be a, a, a close-up of that, uh, of that uh, display. The model, uh, we, I mean, we, we had to build a model for, uh, for, for the flow and transport in this, uh, in this aquifer, and this model is based on the, on the geometry of the sandbox, uh, but basically water is flowing from right to left, and uh, you, we have uh, yes, uh, fixed uh, hydraulic head on the right, a fixed hydraulic head on the left, lower, and, uh, and the mm, in contamination is injected at the location uh, uh, signaled by the triangle, uh, the, the red triangle, okay? So we inject there, and then we have uh, the, the, the black dots are the observation locations. There are 25 observation locations that uh, will uh, we will get the breakthrough curve in each one of those uh, locations and from those breakthrough curves we will try to basically derive which is the distribution of the conductivities and also the location of the injection the time at which the injection started and uh, uh, the time at which uh, injection uh, ended um, in the uh, in the other side of, uh, of or you have seen there is a, there was a, a black room uh, uh, where uh, we had uh, this blue light uh, of uh, neon because the what we injected for this experiment was fluorescein, okay, which uh, reacts uh, to blue light uh, with a fluorescent as a fluorescent uh, uh, tracer, okay. So that's uh, uh, what we injected and what we did was we took pictures of the of the fluorescency. Of the of the solute, and we mm, translated the colors uh, that we observed into concentration after a, a lengthy calibration uh, period. This is just one a snapshot. Uh, I'm going to move to the side. Here, uh, the, the the black dot is uh, where the injection happened. As I told you, uh, water is flowing from right to left, and uh, and this is just uh, after uh, some time. Uh, uh, after the, niche, the, the beginning of the, of the injection, uh, how the fluorescein had uh, distributed in the, in the aquifer. Obviously, the heterogeneity uh, uh, that we have there and, and the, the situation, the location of the high and low uh, conductivity 
uh, areas uh, is the one that is driving the why in this plume is going up first and then it's going down. Uh, this is controlled by, by this uh, heterogeneity. The experiment itself uh, lasted uh, uh, 3,000 uh, 3, seconds. Uh, and uh, in those 3,000 seconds, there was an injection of 20 milligrams uh, per liter during 1,200, okay? because the idea was also to identify when the injection and the, and the, the beginning and end of ending of the injection uh, happened. There were 25 observation points, as I told you. And the technique we use for the inversion is the ensemble camel filter. Uh, the semi camel filter is an assimilation technique, uh, technique that uh, uh, has been very successful in uh, hydrogeology, in petroleum engineering, because uh, you should not forget that at the end we are dealing with a fluid underground. What I'm telling you about, uh, I mean, everything that I'm, I'm presenting to you can be uh, applied into uh, petroleum applications. And, um, and what uh, the semi camel filter is doing is, is like running to uh, Two, two lines uh, in parallel. I mean, you have your model that is predicting how the, uh, the plume is moving, and then you take observations. And uh, you compare the observations and, and the model every, in this case, every 30 seconds. And uh, in each time that you take the observations, compare with the, uh, with the predictions. And if there is a, a, a deviation between predictions and observations, there is a correction of the model. And then you make a new prediction for, for the next 30 seconds, new, uh, new observations. Then if there is a the, the discrepancy between predictions and, and observations, there is a correction. And uh, it continues like that. It's an iterative process that at the end gives you, a, 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 as you will see, a very good representation of uh, those parameters we are uh, looking after. This is the, the final description of the lock conductivity in the aquifer that we obtained with uh, this method. We did an estimation uh, in a very fine grid. I mean, you see the small squares. I mean, we're trying to estimate which is the conductivity in each one of those small squares. And you see that uh, at the end, uh, the areas of high and low conductivity are uh, pretty much well uh, characterized. If we look at uh, <clears throat> the characterization of the location of the injection, in this case, we have uh, the X coordinate and the Z coordinate. Here, you, you what you have in, in these box plots is the estimations that we are obtaining as, as time steps are passing. I mean, as every one of, uh, all, each one of these 30 second steps uh, uh, are passing. At the beginning, the box plot is very wide because I mean, we don't have much information about where the, uh, uh, the injection happened. But, uh, but as we keep um, sampling, you see that the box plots are getting smaller and smaller because we are getting uh, closer to the uh, to the uh, to the estimation. The final estimation at uh, the time step 90, uh, you can see well uh, we don't we don't match exactly. I mean, uh, injection happened at x equal 86. Uh, our estimate was 85 plus minus certain uh, uncertainty. It's clear that uh, in these cases in which you have only limited information, you can get a good estimate, but never a perfect estimate. I mean, there will be always residual uncertainty, and there could be always uh, some, some bias about uh, your final estimate. The Z coordinate, which will be the vertical coordinate, it's, 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 uh, I mean, the estimation, I would say, is, is much better, it's much closer. Well, it's, yeah, it's a little bit better than, than the X1, but in, in any case, in both cases, we have a very good uh, estimate of what the location is, uh, plus minus basically one pixel, one, uh, one, one of, uh, of those discretization pixels that uh, we got the, the location. And, uh, and this is uh, a comparison between the, the true plume that we observe uh, in, the, in the laboratory and the plume that we model uh, after we have basically calibrated that we have collected all that information and we have get the best model possible the plume that we will predict is this one here so as you can see the the prediction is is, is very close uh, to the one observed i'm going to show you again this is uh, this is the truth uh, and this is the the prediction that uh, as i said is 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 very close to the to the one so we did succeed in uh, in uh, characterizing the, the conductivity in the uh, in the system, but also the location and, and the starting time and, uh, and the ending time. So I will conclude just uh, uh, telling you that heterogeneity plays a crucial role in the fate and transport of uh, solutes uh, in groundwater, that uh, improper modeling will result on improper remediation strategies if we are using this uh, 
uh, for for remediation and uh, and it will be the same i mean you are thinking about an oil reservoir uh, it will it, it may basically determine i mean which will be your rules of exploitation of the of the reservoir uh, if you do properly or not uh, the, uh, this characterization of the heterogeneity of uh, of the permeability or the hydraulic conductivity inverse models uh, as i show you are, are a very important tool to improve the characterization of this uh, subsurface uh, subsurface uh, using uh, easy to gather uh, information and uh, that's all uh, thanks very much uh, thank you thank you very much uh, dr jaime for the fruitful presentation uh, we have uh, one question from Hassan zain uh, he asked about could you read uh, can artificial intelligence I can read the question is uh, yes. can artificial intelligence and optimization algorithms provide good predictions of hydraulic conductivity in heterogeneous aquifers well actually what the uh, what the ensemble camel filter is at the end is, is an optimization algorithm but indeed I mean optimization algorithms have been used uh, uh, since the very beginning in inverse modeling and uh, and right now everybody in my, myself included we are trying to include the, the latest techniques on uh, on machine learning on artificial intelligence in uh, in trying to improve uh, I mean the, the techniques that we are already using so the answer would be the yes uh, to both questions I have one question, uh, Dr. Jaime. You have a simulator, you built simulator, and you, uh, and you find that uh, the control of distribution of the contaminant is uh, hydraulic conductivity on the heterogeneity. Then you did a uh, geostatistical model. My question is, uh, what is the optimum number of points uh, to, to have good model with less uncertainty? Because as you know, in the subsurface, we don't have many wells yani, to control. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, we, we did. Uh, we have analyzed this uh, question, which is the question that comes uh, always uh, when you look at, uh, at, at our results. I mean, many people say, I mean, you are using too many data. It's yes. clear that there is a threshold be below which, uh, I mean, you don't gather enough information to actually characterize. And uh, this threshold is very much related to the uh, correlation scale of the conductivity. I mean, if the conductivity has no correlation so if, if it varies uh, completely erratically in uh, in space then there is no chance that you're going you are going to be able to do anything but if there is if there is correlation which always happens i mean because uh, uh, like uh, in the cross section i show you this a sedimentary basin so you expect to have long correlation in the horizontal not so much in the vertical then this correlation will help you into the characterization and what we found is having two or three observations per correlation okay if you you compute the correlation uh, uh, length of the of your of your uh, conductivity and, and the correlation is say uh, three kilometers but then to have uh, uh, observations every kilometer which would be three three observations in these three thousand meters that would be enough i mean we related this uh, sampling density to the uh, correlation length of the uh, underlying conductivity and did you use the facies or geology to control this distribution, the petrophysical parameters? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I haven't entered into the details, but yes, I mean, generally, these uh, this, uh, numerical models, uh, this geostatistical part, uh, it, it, it's built in, in a two stage uh, approach. In the first stage, we build the facies, okay, at the heterogeneous facies. And then we put the heterogeneous conductivity in each of the faces. That, uh, that's what we generally do in, this, in these cases. Thank you very much. The floor for you, Dr. Isam. Well, uh, finally, I would like to thank the uh, speakers for their fantastic presentations. Uh, we learned a lot from those uh, uh, presentations. Uh, I would like to personally and on behalf of my colleagues, behalf of the university, to thank Mr. Su, uh, Dr. Gomez, and Dr. Uh, Page for being with us today. Uh, thank you very much and uh, we look forward uh, to see you maybe in kvpm in the very next uh, future once the uh, pandemic uh, restrictions are uh, eased thank you very much uh, we appreciate it and uh, just to remind you we have another session after one hour or so so please uh, uh, come back thank you very much thanks to you for the invitation thank you 
Thank you. Thank you. How to, this is will deal on how to deal with the, the, the situation of agriculture in Saudi Arabia. We should focus more on agriculture in the central and south of Saudi Arabia. And more, they have to do some use of some modified crop in the north to cope with drought. Uh, this is mean that if you have more agriculture potentiality, we should do it more in the south and central. Now, this is the green nature. Uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, Saudi Arabia. This is we talk about uh, climate change. It's one of the issues that for the green is really to do with uh, the climate change because this is related to the future of the uh, of the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East, in fact. And this is also about uh, the, the green shift for the zero carbon, which is going to be in 2060. And this is really we need to go consider in the future. And this is one map which shows the region or the, uh, the Asia uh, department is responsible for the green issue. You can see that the Ministry of, of uh, Environment is responsible for the, uh, this region. And then the each, uh, issue, uh, each region will be affected. Like, for example, uh, the Meteorology Center is responsible for the climate change and the weather. And this is really should be taken into consideration in the future. This is the, the green shield support, uh, but this is all what you can read, really. And this is really the, the idea of the increase of rainfall. This is, you can see, it is increased here and decrease here. This is the, what you should consider. And this is actually the, with what we need. We need to improve the hydrological uh, infrastructure for including dams. Uh, and, uh, but also what we need, we, we need to, uh, to update our early warning system, which is operated by the North National the meteorological center NCM, and this is really very important for the for the region to for because we we may uh, face some flooding in the region which is really had to be monitored by radars and by satellite and by other stuff and this is the we need to increase the agriculture in the south region and more increase on the on the land harvesting in the south and the other regions so thank you very much My, my presentation finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mansour, for the fruitful presentation. Now the floor is open uh, for uh, questions. I may have a question, uh, Dr. Mohammed. You are welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Mansour, for the nice presentation. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the uh, uh, the temperature increase in uh, Saudi Arabia. What do you forecast, um, yani the, the effects of uh, temperature increase and the um, increasing the uh, desert land in, in Saudi Arabia? Actually, it's not just only over the, the desert, but also we, uh, it's gonna affect the pilgrims. And also this is what is called heat stress. And really we need to focus more on how to find a way to deal with this uh, temperature and how to use uh, adaptive measures to reduce this temperature. Definitely temperature is gonna be increased. And in Riyadh, it's expected to increase up to 50 degrees in the whole uh, summer. So really we need to have some uh, contribution from the country and reducing this temperature. This is really very important because the Green Initiative is uh, taking the climate change. So really we need to have some adaptive measures to control the temperature. In terms of uh, legislation, what should be done, do you think? Legislation should be, in fact, uh, part of it should be a deal with uh, how to reduce the, the fossil fuels by using renewable energy and using uh, wind energy. And this is part of the deal of the Green Initiative. And this is uh, already being taken into consideration in the whole country. Because we are planning in, the, in Saudi Arabia is to make zero, zero fossil fuels 
by 2006, as been announced by the Crown Prince. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, you want to take over? Yes, Dr. Hassam. Okay, if we have no more questions, then um, we have to go to the next speaker. Is he ready? Yes, Dr. Rabia. Professor Rabia is ready. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mansour. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mansour, for the fruitful okay. presentation. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Professor uh, Rabia Amokhtar. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Good morning to you and good afternoon to, uh, here in Zahran. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's clear. Yes, if you want to introduce uh, Dr. Rabia, um, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, let me introduce uh, Professor uh, Rabia, Rabia uh, Mokhtar, Professor in, in the Department of uh, Biological and Agricultural Engineering and the Zikri Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at, at Texas A&M University. He is the founder of the Texas A&M Water Energy Food Nexus uh, Initiatives uh, 2015. He served as a Dean of uh, the Faculty of Agricultural and Food uh, Science between 2018 to 2021 at the American University of Beirut, uh, where he, uh, he also established, uh, established the Water, Energy, Food, Health, uh, Nexus, Renewable uh, Resources Initiatives. Uh, Mokhtar uh, served as a governor of the World Water Council uh, through his research, Professor Mukhtar develop, develops uh, tools to provide the uh, societies and policy uh, makers with information uh, to address uh, global resources challenges. His focus area includes the characterization of uh, the soil water uh, medium using thermodynamic uh, modeling and the efficiency of non-traditional water application for sustainable uh, integrated water management. By this, uh, let me uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Rabia to present his uh, topic. Uh, 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 the floor for you, Dr. Rabia. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yassin, for your kind introduction. And thank you all for the organizers for giving me the chance to share with you some of the lessons learned uh, from Texas on uh, terms of uh, water, energy, food, uh, Nexus approach to bridge the water gap. It's a pleasure to uh, be sharing that with you. I'd like to introduce uh, the team uh, at uh, Purdue University, Texas A&M, and at AUB who uh, contributed to this uh, effort uh, looking at the water, energy, food, Nexus uh, platform. I uh, will give you a very brief uh, overview about who we are, uh, some of the global trends. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the Nexus approach and the system approach and the need for that. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, propose a, a platform uh, or a, a high level principle for water security in dry land. And I'm gonna share with you some success stories uh, from Texas with uh, some concluding remarks. Uh, so the water energy food Nexus Research Group at Texas A&M. Uh, we do, as Dr. Yassin mentioned earlier, we do research in the uh, Water Energy Food Nexus platform. We have several applications there, uh, including the one I'm going to be sharing today and several other in the uh, MENA region. Uh, again, as Dr. Yassin mentioned, our group does a lot of uh, work on soil dynamics and in particular, uh, green water uh, dynamics, uh, looking at the soil moisture and how it uh, can be used to uh, precisely give the soil uh, the amount of water needed uh, for improving food security. 
Uh, last but not least, we work on the non-traditional water, and some of that will be through the presentation uh, that I'll share today. Uh, we have a lot of engagement activities uh, across uh, Texas and uh, across the globe. And in particular, I'd like to share with you the global service learning experience, which is a capstone experience for engineering students to work with uh, other universities abroad. We have about 200 projects with, uh, over the years, and uh, some many of them are still active. Uh, we're involving students in uh, the service uh, component and engagement component of uh, our mission. I do teach a graduate course in the Nexus as well that covers uh, the basic principles of the Nexus and the system approach, as well as some of the application. I I'm going to start with the high level picture in terms of why uh, the system approach is needed and why the Nexus is critical for us to uh, follow. Uh, we all know that the uh, water gap, the energy gap, and the food gap is already upon us. It's increasing and is projected to increase furthermore. But not only the gap that is critical uh, that I'd like to share with you here, it's the interlinkage in these sectors. What that means that if you have a water scarcity, as many parts of the uh, earlier, Dr. Mansour was, was talking about the, the, uh, the impact of water resources from climate change, when we have a climate uh, induced, uh, inducing uh, shortages in water and water scarcity, uh, that interlinkage also triggers a food insecurity, as we see in many parts of the MENA region. And also, of course, the interlinkages with temperature rise and the need for more energy is also evident. So it's the shortages interlinkage and it's the system that allow us to really uh, look at the inequity and variability in the distribution of these resources, uh, this non-stationarity, and looking at the unsustainable, non-sustainable sustainability in terms of consumption and the growing gap between demand and supply. And last but not least, that the business model we have today, uh, we cannot really manage our primary resources with the current business model we have. So we need a different model. We need a new a business model for managing our water in particular that goes beyond the allocative model that we have uh, seen. And an example of that is what we see recently in uh, the river basin water conflicts and the, the, the lack of resilience and sustainability of communities. I believe we have an opportunity to work at the system level that integrates our knowledge of the uh, the, the food production, the energy efficiency, the integrated water resources management to reach a place that government societies and business community can work together and allow for synergy in the system. And I'll show you some of the uh, success examples we have here. So a system approach allows us first to understand this complexity. The system is very complex. It's not complicated, only it's also, com it's also complex, which means that it's nonlinear, and it doesn't have a straightforward solution and the solutions are, are convoluted. Uh, with that understanding, we can understand the interdependencies and hopefully reduce that interdependencies. That will improve the community resilience and promote ecosystem and human health and well-being. So this is the why I believe we need to look at these uh, high level system level solutions. So before I move into the success stories that I mentioned, I'd like to stop and talk about alternative water sources for irrigation, and in particular, in the MENA region in Thailand. And I'm going to look at the first. Uh, it may not be appropriate in the desert area because we don't have a lot of rainfall. However, the bulk of our, uh, what I call uh, the green water management and accounting is uh, responsible for the bulk of our food uh, basket. And many, many parts of the MENA region has more, in fact, we did the analysis in North Africa. In North Africa, as an example, has more green water than has blue water. And yet we don't manage it to its fullest. Uh, and management means understanding the dynamics, understanding the flow processes, and more importantly, define what that green water resource is. And I think this is our first uh, resource that I'd like us to start looking into more carefully, especially that it is responsible for the bulk of the food basket. It's also responsible for the bulk of the uh, trade in agriculture. 
The second is wastewater reuse. Uh, this is a, a, an area that we could use more research in terms of the safety, in terms of the risk, in terms of the technological advancement, and in terms of the, uh, the, the social acceptability. And I think that that has a room in our water portfolio that needs to be explored. It may not be appropriate for all of our usages, but it has to have some level of focus in terms of looking at our uh, water portfolio moving forward. Number three, I'll focus a bit more on it in the presentation is precision irrigation. It's only when I understand the dynamics, the, the, uh, the very uh, complex dynamics of soil water and the swelling shrinking properties of the soil and looking at precise uh, site-specific irrigation, then I, I have to move into beyond the efficiency and move into water productivity uh, that allow me to start questioning the land use, land management at a much uh, larger. So this is what I believe is a strategy that could be implemented in our region, in the MENA region for alternative water sources for irrigation. The reason this becoming more critical, and if you notice here, I did not include uh, blue water because moving forward with all the climate change with all the the pressure on the the uh, the blue water we will not have abundance of blue water for irrigation so we must look at these alternative water and i think that's the platform that i really would like us to focus on moving forward anyway uh, at the bottom of all of that i have to make a stop and uh, recognize and acknowledge the role of soil and soil water for water and food security. Soil has been ignored for many, many, many years. I think we know better now that soil is at the heart of our water and food security and needs to be looked at in that lens. It is where uh, most of our soil water lies, is where the interface with, uh, with the plant and food security is also the home for many, many of our uh, biodiversity in the soil. And I think it needs to have a focus and I would not wanna to dwell too much on this because that's not the focus of, uh, of the presentation. However, I'd like to state that most of the models, including climate change models, include hydrologic models, use an old concept of soil, which is based on texture. Texture does not define, define properties and behavior of soil. We need to move beyond texture and we need to look into soil dynamics as a basis of the uh, soil water modeling that is very important to hydrologic modeling and soil and water modeling and food security modeling and climate change. Uh, the, the last uh, point I'd like to make here is soil has been recognized as a sink for carbon. With climate change, I think this is a resource that we need to look at that allow us to have a better way to managing our carbon emission as well. So uh, this is a, a highlight of what I mentioned earlier, that the green water space is a, is a space that is not explored. And this data comes from the North Africa uh, countries, where the combination of the light and the, the dark green constitute what I define as a green water. It's uh, multiple fold as compared to uh, blue water, which is the freshwater resource. And yet we don't really have a unified way of measuring it and managing it. That's why I call for a green water revolution where we look at this as a resource and better manage it. Uh, some uh, few important statistics that it is important that soil water is important for sustaining ecosystem services. It has more than two thirds of global food production in rain fed agriculture. And uh, it has, uh, even though the, the, the blue water uh, space is of contentious use. However, I think the future lies into where uh, this uh, green water can be used effectively. So let me look at uh, shifting gears and start looking into uh, wastewater. This uh, study was conducted a few years ago in Tunis, uh, where we looked at the feasibility, technological, economic, as well as social acceptability of treated wastewater for agriculture. Uh, the challenge there is, is the fact that many of the production sites of treated wastewater is away from agriculture. So how do you develop this uh, concentric circles of energy map that allow us to really look maybe at a low source of energy to pump that water from the production 
of the treated wastewater site into areas where it is uh, produced. Anyway, uh, the, the study that we conducted, we uh, were able to provide 6.2 million cubic meter per year made available through that wastewater uh, facility. And we, uh, uh, we actually, because the, uh, uh, the, there is no, of course, there is a trade-off with energy, but uh, this, is, this is something I, I will, would want to focus on in a different uh, context. Uh, in terms of food, we were able to have additional 3.6 hectare of irrigated crops only from that small wastewater uh, treatment facility. So it's a, it's a resource that needs to be uh, acknowledged. So shifting gears now again into uh, some of our success stories in Texas in terms of bridging water gap. Texas has a significant water gap that needs to be bridged. It has uh, uh, if you recall the earlier statistics I shared globally, 40 to 50 percent, in fact, 40 percent water gap globally by 2030 and about uh, a 50 percent gap by 2050. Texas is following the same trend. So we were looking at ways in which we can bridge that gap. So the question is that we have 40 percent water gap by 2070. Uh, this is due to uh, growing demand of municipalities. This is because also uh, climate change will impact uh, uh, Texas. So the question is, how do we look at a system level approach to bridge that gap? Looking at the population growth, climate change, while we look at the variability of water, we, because of the non-stationarity, we are looking at uh, uh, the, the, the uh, lack of coherence in terms of water availability across the, the season. So this is the question that we were uh, looking at. And of course, uh, we wanted to look at the water energy food nexus as a platform. The reason, I'll show you the reason why a nexus is very critical for, uh, for, for, for Texas and identifying hotspots. So hotspots are vulnerable sectors of the, of the uh, either vulnerable sectors or vulnerable region at a certain scale that have a vulnerability for, uh, in this case, for water. So this is why an access approach is needed. This is the map of Texas. All of the red uh, dots are, uh, are along what we call the Eagle Ford, Eagle Ford shale gas. This is where most of the energy production is happening in Texas. So all of these red dots are wells, extraction wells for energy uh, production. And that is along the, what they call the Eagle Ford Shale. Uh, this is the hydraulic fracturing sites. If you look at the blue, and blue are concentrated in major cities of Houston, San Antonio, and looking at Austin. So those are the areas where you have heavy population, increasing population. So those blue dots are uh, extraction wells from uh, four uh, municipalities. And you look at the north, in the Lubbock area and the Amarillo area, these green dots are extraction wells for agriculture. So right there in the, uh, in, in the state of Texas, you've got huge competition for water allocation between the energy sector, between the agriculture sector, and between the uh, municipalities, uh, water for, for people. So right there, you see a lot of uh, uh, significant uh, challenges in the Lubbock between water and food, Looking into uh, this area with, with the with the energy production between uh, uh, water and energy, and in municipalities, specifically San Antonio, which is one of the largest growing cities in the U.S. Uh, for for water and population. So, having three hotspots, as as I defined them earlier, the first hotspot is that if you look at the ground water table in Lubbock, and you see that the water table is actually declining because of the overpumping, And most of that water is being used for agriculture. The second hotspot is in the San Antonio area where a lot of the uh, urban uh, agriculture, but also urban communities are extracting water for uh, the municipalities. And the third hotspot is in South Texas where you have water energy, where energy is uh, thirsty for, for water, especially with hydraulic fracturing. So these are the three hotspots we, we, uh, we identified, and we wanted to look at each of these hotspots case studies separately. So the first is agriculture, where the economy is reliant on agriculture. Most of the water sources, the majority of it is coming from 
uh, agriculture. Uh, so the alternative that we look at one is to look at diversifying uh, water sources, looking at reclaimed water as ground as, as groundwater, surface water, and and uh, uh, other water conservation. We looked also at dry land agriculture. This is not a, a favorite topic in the Lubbock area because farmers are used for generations to pump water and uh, use it for irrigation. So to tell them to move into dry land farming, low input, low output, where they're not going to maintain that same level of productivity is a difficult, was a difficult task. Uh, last options we were looking at in terms of energy sources to diversify the energy portfolio for the Lubbock area. And here are some of the uh, outcome results for scenario two, where we were looking at, this happens to be the, the best alternative for, for, for Lubbock, where the potential of bridging 100% of the water gap through combination of one, reclaimed water, use all of the reclaimed water for agriculture, increase in dry land farming, and invest in looking at a, a, a different type of uh, energy resources for supporting the agriculture. If we switch to case study two, which is the low impact development in San Antonio, the objective of course is to provide the, the community with a sustainable water source, especially that San Antonio does not have enough water to maintain its municipality and they're considering actually, actually buying water from neighborhood communities and pumping water for at least a hundred miles into San Antonio. And that has been rejected through the community because the community uh, in, in, uh, in some of these areas do not want uh, the uh, municipality of San Antonio to, uh, to uh, pump their water. So what we're looking at the system approach here that allow for potential uh, for water collected groundwater recharge through low impact development strategies. The trade-off is there is that it costs money and that's why people uh, are, were objecting to it. So we were looking into, into various scenarios uh, from a bioretention basin to permeable uh, pavement, rainwater harvesting and conventional stormwater system that augment the groundwater and provide additional water to the city of San Antonio. Of course, the trade-off is that it will cost about $4 billion, but still it's less expensive and socially more acceptable than pumping water from Caldwell, which is a neighboring city about 100 miles away from San Antonio. Actually, more than 100 miles away from San Antonio. So focusing on the third hotspot in Texas, which is the, uh, the Eagle Ford shale gas, where a lot of that water is concentrated in time and space to support the uh, shale gas industry. This is a very controversial, uh, difficult subject to talk about because energy uh, security in Texas is very important and, and it's also a source for an economic growth. So we were looking at different options in there. And the options has a lot of policy implications. Those we were looking at different production side, uh, uh, different production uh, uh, systems. We were looking into desalination, and we were looking at other priorities that look into how can we maintain the uh, energy production safely, uh, because th there's a trade-off not only with water use for this uh, uh, energy system. There's also a road safety because the uh, trucks going in and out from a hydraulic fracturing site produce a uh, road safety hazard. So the implication is a policy implication, the regulation and tax subsidy for the energy sector and looking at innovations in technology. How can we use non-hydraulic uh, fracturing? Actually they exist, but still they're very expensive. How do we make them less expensive? Uh, last but not least is consumer behavior, reaction to, uh, to the water uh, energy uh, mix. Again, this is in summary, uh, we were looking at how do we bridge that Texas water gap, looking at three hotspots in San Antonio, in Lubbock, and in uh, the Eagle for Shale. Uh, all of them require additional investment that the state need to look at, and each will uh, actually conserve or generate additional water sources to bridge that water gap. It can be done. We showed that it can be done, and there are other examples that I did not share with you here, uh, but the point is that the, there are ways in which we can uh, bridge that water gap, but looking at the system level, not looking in within the silo. The second step in the study is to look at 
uh, it's not only de developing the trade-offs and developing the analytics. You need to really uh, conduct uh, a statewide dialogue that allow us to look at this whole water energy food uh, community uh, from, a, from, from a conflict between these, as I mentioned earlier, into a dialogue and cooperation. And this has taken a lot of our effort uh, in, in this area, uh, conducting uh, workshops and, and talking to the water energy food nexus community for a what we call convergence workshops, that these solutions make sense to the community and let's adopt them and see how we can implement them. I'd like uh, uh, very briefly uh, share some concluding remarks. So bridging the water gap requires holistic yet localized solution as uh, I've shared with you. It does take a multi-stakeholder approach. It does take a, a uh, dialogue with the community, building trust with that community. It's also looking into accounting for spatial and temporal distribution of resources. Uh, these are localized, for example, water is a localized challenge as we mentioned earlier. Uh, we need to account for the interconnections between water and competing resource system and growing stresses. We need to communicate our trade-offs and have built a consensus and build a convergence, as I mentioned earlier. Last but not least, governance issues in the water and energy food nexus is huge. Uh, so the question remains, who pays for it? And that's a question that uh, will be with us for a while and uh, uh, it will be something that we need to be further discussing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Rabia Mukhtar, for the fruitful presentation. Now the floor for uh, questions. Actually, I get one question here in Q&A box uh, from Dr. Uh, Hussam Balwisha. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rabia, for the nice talk. I have a question regarding the water, energy, uh, food, nexus. What is the environmental needs in this? He asked about the environmental needs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the environmental footprint is all over the, the, the nexus. Uh, it goes into the pollution, which we quantify. It goes into water footprint, land footprint, soil impact, soil health. Uh, they're all integrated into the analytics. I did not have the chance to further discuss the analytics, but the environmental uh, trade-offs, I talked about trade-offs. Uh, in fact, we go beyond the environment. We looked at what we call one health. We looked at human health. We looked at uh, ecosystem health as well. Uh, so in the Texas uh, trade-off between water and energy, for example, we looked at number of accidents uh, beyond the pollution, air pollution and, and, and water pollution. We looked at the uh, risk uh, of the trucking water into in and out of the uh, hydraulic fracturing site and their impact on traffic and death and safety. So the environment and ecosystem and human health and safety are crucial to, to these trade-offs that uh, I mentioned. I did not have the chance to uh, 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 dwell on the analytics. I'll be happy to share if you could send me. I'm going to put my, my uh, email uh, to the, on the chat and uh, we'll be happy to share further uh, uh, details on that. There are uh, other questions in the chat, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, another question. From, uh, do you uh, consider uh, water as a uh, commodity or a vital, uh, vital need uh, in the case of Texas? Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer from Texas. We have, uh, Texas is a privatized entity in Texas, in, 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 sorry, water is a privatized entity in Texas. We have over 1,500 water utilities, 1,500 water utilities. So there's, there is every, every city has its own water utility and it's a private water utility. So uh, it's a challenge. If I'm looking at this from a sustainable development goals, SDGs perspective, uh, access is difficult here in the state of Texas. If I don't pay my water bill, uh, I can assure you that I don't have access to water. 
So it's a challenge for us in Texas to look at equity and access to water when uh, water is a privatized entity. Uh, personally, as a scientist, I do believe access to clean and water, uh, clean and, and safe water is a right, human right to everyone. Uh, so, so we need to move in that direction. Uh, but there are some governance issues that we need to be dealing with. Governance that I, my last statement there, I would recall it, who pays for it, is a big question. Uh, I believe that the taxpayer money should be paying for safe and uh, uh, good quality access to water and hygiene, which is what the sustainable development, UN Sustainable De Development Goals has, uh, we're committed to. Uh, but we have some ways to go. I have a question. Another question. Uh, he said, thanks, my question. <laughs> I sure have uh, one question uh, for Dr. Rabia. Uh, for example, here in Saudi Arabia, they, they stop uh, uh, cultivate the wheat because they use uh, high, highly using of groundwater. Uh, to what extent uh, the concept of water uh, nexus uh, can calculate this uh, of, uh, water conservation policy and convert the virtual cost of the water how we can cal calculate and make balance between importing wheat yeah. or uh, uh, growing it here? Thank you for an excellent question. Uh, I'm glad in 2016, the kingdom has stopped the wheat program. Yes. Now, I do, I'm, I'm very delighted that in 2016, they stopped it. And I'm, I'm happy that uh, we're moving away from, the, uh, from that. Uh, it's a very important question. It ties to the very, very important issue of food security. What does food security mean? Uh, if, I, if, if I go back to the biblical times and the, the ancient times, uh, food security means I have silos that I fill with the grain that I can satisfy my, my people's need of food. Today, food security means different things. Uh, means a robust supply chain, uh, means a portfolio, of a combination of local production and trade uh, that needs to be built uh, carefully based on uh, a, a, a robust uh, food portfolio. So it does not mean I need to produce everything. In fact, very few countries today can have a complete food sovereignty. I believe that we need to maximize our local production to a point where we don't impact our land, our uh, water, our uh, uh, environmental, in, in, in have, it, have it the least environmental impact. So how much you maximize within the uh, bounds of your resources is a question that we need to ask locally. Uh, so, and I think the Nexus is the right platform to allow us to ask these questions. In fact, we, we just finished a study in Lebanon uh, in partnership with FAO asking the very basic question, Lebanon, as you all know, is, is facing significant economic uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, the meltdown of the economy had, uh, does not provide the, the population the ability to import food. So the basic question today, I need cash money to bring in, and agriculture sector is one of those sectors that can bring cash money in the country. At the same time, I need to produce enough food to feed my people. So what's that balance for Lebanon is extremely critical. And we just finished that study with FAO and it's, it's actually the report uh, is made available. So the Nexus is the right platform to allow us to look at these uh, high level big questions. Uh, one last, thank you, Dr. Uh, Rabia. One last question regarding the use of uh, uh, tertiary treated uh, wastewater in uh, agriculture. Nowadays, they use it uh, in many countries, even Saudi Arabia. To what extent the quality of water and do you touch this in your research? Yani? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we, our research project uh, focused to a big extent on water reuse and the safety. When we look at safety, we're not only looking at uh, short term, we're looking at long term safety for human on the ecosystem and soil health. Uh, so depending on what level of uh, inf influence you have and the, the treatment level, uh, our experience in, in Texas, for example, the treated wastewater is far superior 
than the groundwater because groundwater is has high salinity. The treated wastewater does not have the, the salinity. So our experience in Texas that uh, it's very, very safe uh, long term. And we had the 10 year study uh, in Texas that showed that. Uh, in other parts, in, in Lebanon, for example, the treated wastewater, many of the uh, many of the supposedly treated wastewater is untreated. So it has a lot of uh, still a lot of pathogen, which is I can live with pathogen because you can treat it. That has a lot of tox toxicities that have a long term impact on soil health and, and on, on the plant uh, and food security issues. So these are critical issues. Uh, and I go, go back to the nexus. The nexus is the platform to look at the trade off. In one side, you have the positives in, in providing water, additional water for food. On the other side, you need to look at health, safety, and risk. And, and this is where the, the, the Nexus can provide the platform to quantify these trade off and minimize the risk, uh, both potential risk uh, and, and also perception. There are a lot of perception that waste treated wastewater is not safe. And I think we need to look at uh, decipher between the, the actual risk and the perception of, of uh, uh, false, false risk. Thank you very much. Uh, now is the floor for you, Dr. Hassan, if you want. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, um, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, uh, follow up on one question uh, that was raised, which is uh, growing wheat specifically or uh, growing food. Don't you think that there is um, another dimension, which is the sovereignty of the country or the independence of the country uh, to have its own food uh, so that it will not you know, uh, uh, um, its food security will be hinges to other political issues from, you know, around the world? Absolutely. And that's why I mentioned earlier in the, in the, in the trade-off analysis, there is, a, there is a weight that the policymaker would include. We face the same issue in Texas with oil, with, with, the, with, the, with the shale gas, uh, because oil security and energy security in the state of Texas is very high. So even though it has a water, high water footprint, the legislators would vote for uh, compromising on water security for the sake of energy security. You're, uh, Dr. Isam, absolutely correct. Uh, but again, it has to be looked at a bit higher level picture. Uh, and the, the, we did the analysis for all the uh, Arab world countries, the entire Arab world countries. Saudi Arabia has the highest food security system, the highest robust food security system. Why? Because they, di they diversify. You had a very diversified portfolio. So I'm not, I'm not dependent on the Australian wheat. I'm not dependent on one country to import from. So part of that security is to diversify your portfolio and import from many, many countries. For example, uh, you had a, unfortunately you had a war in Syria. So the food security was disrupted. The food supply chain from Syria was disrupted going to Saudi Arabia. But the, the kingdom has a, a, a huge portfolio of importers that reduces the risk. So I think that we have to manage that risk. Uh, yes, of course, you cannot be dependent on one country because if you had diplomatic, uh, uh, they, they can influence your sovereignty, you can influence that. But in Saudi Arabia, because they understand that they have a diversified portfolio, they have the upper hand. If, if they, if, if us, as an example, if Australia doesn't want to sell to the kingdom their wheat, they can go to, to Russia and get that wheat, or they could go to the US. So that's the discussion need to happen. It's a strategic discussion. And you're absolutely right. We need to make sure that the country has a sovereign uh, food, food system, but it does not need to be locally produced. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, thank you very much. One last question, maybe very fast. Uh, oil and gas producing countries, they have always the, this problem of uh, what is called the produced water, uh, or the associated water. So what do you guys uh, have to do with it in Texas? You know, I spent quite a bit of time in Qatar. We, we lived actually in Qatar. I was uh, the, the first uh, inaugural director for the Qatar Energy and Environment Research Center. And, and my colleagues in the, in the uh, oil and gas, they say, we, we're we're in the water business before we are in the oil business because they manage huge tons of, of water. It's about cost. 
it's about cost. If you have the low cost of technology uh, to manage that water, then it can be used. I think at this stage, it's too costly to, uh, to take it, treat it before you, you can use it. It's, too, it's, 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 all, it's all about money at the moment. Uh, so we have other resources that are less expensive to, to deal with, and we're going to deal with it. Uh, but it is, I think it's in the future, it should always be in the back of our mind that this is a huge uh, uh, issue and a huge resource that can be used for augmenting the water portfolio. But the economic, the economic technology is there. Economics has to be uh, right. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rabia. Uh, actually, it's a very interesting topic. We start from climate and then now we, uh, uh, we, start, we talk about the nexus and we believe that this is not an easy decision to have. Uh, this, it needs models as you make it very, compli very complicated input, uh, food, water, uh, uh, environment, so that the government uh, uh, even government, um, uh, the policies need to have more integration, uh, develop models. Uh, it's our pleasure today also to have uh, uh, with us uh, Professor Thomas. Uh, we'll talk also about uh, water nexus. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, our speaker. You can share your screen now. Okay. Uh, professor Thomas uh, Kressman is a professor emeritus in the School of Geosciences, uh, University of South Florida, uh, Temba. Uh, he has invest, uh, investigated uh, uh, ecology, management, restoration, and conservation of freshwater uh, wetlands, uh, lakes, and rivers in the subtropics and tropics uh, for more than uh, 44 years. His current research focuses on uh, water security issues uh, in the Caribbean, Middle East, and North Africa, and interaction and interaction among ecosystem, human societies, and the nexus of water, energy, and food. Dr. Chris Mann is the chair of uh, the International uh, Board of the International, International uh, Balkan Environment Center in Greece. And he has uh, uh, consulted uh, with UNDV, uh, World Bank, and uh, Inter-American uh, Development Bank. He has delivered uh, nearly 300 uh, presentations uh, at uh, scientific uh, meeting throughout the uh, world. And he has uh, written uh, more than 100 refereed publication, two books and 29 uh, book, book chapters. Uh, following uh, 30 years at the University of uh, Florida, Dr. Chrisman uh, joined the University of South Florida in 2007. Now the floor for you, uh, Professor Thomas. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a lot uh, better doing Zoom than, than these long plane flights. But um, I, 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 Dr. Motar had a very interesting talk, and I think you're going to see a lot of synergism between our two talks. Uh, with that, um, uh, with that. Um, I should get started. The nexus is normally viewed as just the interaction of water, energy, and food. But we, a few years ago, we, we put it in the perspective of where they meet. It's, it's like a wheel, but in the hub where they meet is health. And we, we haven't really touched on health today, but that's a, a big thing, even in Saudi Arabia, where uh, as, as, as waters dry up, you're getting more and more uh, problems of schistosomiasis and so on. The whole thing, as was mentioned previously, is economy. And the economy is going to control the actual usage of each of these three uh, spokes. Now, the one thing that we can do for any country is to look at the total amount of water, for example, and the amount of water being used. So you can look at how sustainable are you or are you likely to 
to slip for this representative. This is one of the Caribbean countries. Um, they're pretty pretty secure for energy, but they're not secure for water and they're not secure for food. I'm going to do a comparison ultimately between what we're finding in MENA versus what we're finding in the Caribbean. And the parallels are really striking where you're dealing with a dry area versus a wet area. And we, we we're trying to come up with principles. So the nexus is viewed as a three-legged stool that if you somehow affect one of the legs, the thing will collapse. And so currently we have failed states for the nexus sustainability. Obvious ones are Somalia, Yemen, Syria. And I put Jordan on there because Jordan has no sorts of water. It's used up almost all of its groundwater. We'll talk about that. And right behind that, unfortunately for Dr. Motar is, is Lebanon, uh, which is on the verge of collapse as well. In the past, Yemen had the most arable land, more than anywhere else in, 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 the, in the Middle East. Uh, and it was the bre breadbasket of the Middle East. Unfortunately, uh, you went from this wonderful system of, of, uh, of terraced agriculture that was extremely efficient. You saw the same thing in Palestine where it's basically been abandoned, uh, at least in the Israeli portions. And you've gone to irrigation because that's the modern way of, of dealing with, with, with water. But the efficiency of, of irrigation, especially with these spray irrigations is 35%. Dr. Motar knows quite well that we can get it down to some very high efficiencies, but we're still gonna be reliant on growing a crop in an area that doesn't have rainfall. And so what do we do? Um, most of the water of the Middle East, Jordan, Oman, Saudi, and Yemen, historically has been used for agriculture, up to 88, 89% used for agriculture. And in fact, in, in, uh, in Yemen, it has been used totally poorly and used for cut production, so for narcotics rather than for food production. So do we go to large scale agriculture? Do we produce narcotics or do we try to figure out a way to have uh, food for the people and keep it in house? Not importing, but trying to get food. Uh, the, image on, the images on the left are of of irrigation plots in Saudi Arabia, as, as is the one on the right. But what happens as we see also in the, in the Western United States is by using groundwater, these areas end up getting more saline and eventually they become worthless because they got too much saline salinity in the soils. Um, my graduate student, uh, Kamal Al-Jahani, who got his master's and his PhD with me, studied all the springs of Saudi Arabia on two different occasions, 2007, and compared that again in 2008. Uh, we're losing, we went from 46 springs in 1990 to 14 springs in 2007, and we have 11 now, but that includes four that he discovered as part of his work. We are losing the natural waters of Saudi Arabia. And the important thing, when somebody asked about environment, the important thing is that these are biodiversity areas that if you lose them, you're going to lose a tremendous amount of biodiversity. So we're quite concerned about the springs of Saudi Arabia. Uh, going to Jordan, its water supply on the left uh, was the oasis of Azraq. Uh, this was the water supply, the pumping station for Amma, uh, which it's dried up. Uh, I always found it interesting that when the Bedouins uh, wanted to get some uh, water for their sheep, they'd simply shoot a hole in the pipe. And it was a man whose job was to run between Azraq and, and Amman and plug the holes every day. So it's kind of like Hans Brinker in the dike. Uh, now we're trying to find a new water supply and that will be the Red Dead uh, Canal or pipe where they bring water down by gravity from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. Uh, the I'm sorry, go through desal and then pump it up to Amman. This is not sustainable at all, but that's the only water that they got. And so Jordan is, is very much in a water insecurity position. If you got money, you can do desal. And obviously the, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia are very much into desal water. Uh, the one kink in this is that you have Riyadh sitting in the center of the country, 
where you have to pump water in. Anytime you have to pump water in, whether it's in Texas or it's in Saudi Arabia or it's in, or, or in Libya, you're running into trouble. You're moving the supply from where it is to where it's needed. And I'm gonna keep coming back to that theme. So in the great, in, you have a gradient of nexus conditions in the countries that we've been studying. Jordan uses 20 years of groundwater annually. They have no, uh, no energy, and, but they have a desire for agriculture. They want to produce wheat for bread. Saudi Arabia, loss of groundwater and springs, loss of energy, also a desire for agriculture. And they, again, they are to be commended for stopping large scale wheat irrigation that began in, uh, uh, that, that, that took place recently. In Oman, you have lots of water, little energy, but a desire for agriculture. We, over the years, we've been comparing these countries biologically as to what the heck is going on. And um, for MENA, if you look at the three components of the, of the nexus, most are failing in water, many are failing in, food, in, in energy, and almost all of them fail for food. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a bad situation because we deem an energy, I'm sorry, country failing for the nexus if it fails for two out of three. We'll get back to that when we get into the Caribbean. So historically, there's been a shift in water from surface waters in, in springs to groundwater aquifers to desalination. And the trend is to increase water use to get basic water, which means you have to change your mentality as to how you use that water and not waste it. Uh, in 2008, uh, we had a catastrophic drought uh, in the uh, Middle East uh, that affected the important one here too, Iraq and Syria. A severe drought, which in turn led to an abandonment of agricultural land in Syria, a movement of people to the city, putting more pressure on the water resources, and hence you had you had civil strife. Uh, we'll get back to that. So well, many people, some people don't uh, ascribe to it, but, but uh, drought ends up having a major cause of problems uh, in the Middle East uh, politically because you're forcing people into the cities. It's not unlike the dark ages in Europe that were associated with a glacial advance uh, uh, for a short period. So weather, climate definitely have a, an impact. So the current conditions and the projections that we have, um, we're now taking a very close look at Egypt. Egypt's freshwater supply is going down. Their population's going up. Uh, they're in a non-sustainable situation and you're building a new city where you're gonna be pumping more water from the Nile, but you're gonna be pumping it farther into the desert. We'll get back to that. In terms of the numbers of cubic meters per inhabitant per year, uh, most of the countries of the Middle East are in trouble. Uh, they're below what we would consider basic water needs uh, uh, for their people. Now, let's a little bit and go from, I could continue on those kind of statistics, but there's, I wanna talk about what, what are the commonalities that we can look at in the, in the nexus in comparing a water poor area with the water rich area. So I'm, I'm gonna compare uh, MENA to the Caribbean. Uh, we've been studying, we've been studying 10 of the 16 small island developing states in the Caribbean. And in the annual use as a percent of the water, wow, they're rich, all except Barbados, which is over pumping its groundwater and St. Kitts, which is also over pumping its groundwater, but there, there's, there's plenty of water. So then we were terribly surprised, not happily, but terribly surprised, when you then plotted those same countries and their available water as uh, uh, to their people relative to what was considered by the United Nations stressful scarcity or absolute scarcity. Only, only the, the largest islands, Trinidad and Jamaica, 
have plenty of water. And then we ran the statistics, we found the larger the island, obviously the more water you have. But most of these Caribbean islands are starting to show stress and some of them are absolutely overstressed Antigua, Barbados, and St. Kitts and Nevis, for example. How can you be stressed in an area where you have lots of water? When we look at the, uh, we did our analysis of the water, energy, and food uh, profiles for these countries in 2020, all of them failed agriculture. And you ask, how much vacant land do you have to, to have agriculture? You have plenty. Uh, so just like the, in MENA, you're failing for agriculture. It's not because you don't have, a, you, in, the, in your case, is because you, you don't have water. In this case, they've got water and they got land. But they're still failing. And what we did is an analysis we just published on Puerto Rico that showed that it's not the, it's not the, agriculture, it's not the water, it's not the land, it's policies. And we're going to come back to that. Now, we then, we've done an assessment of the water security. We focused on that for the year 2050. And in that, we put in population growth uh, projections as well as climate change projections. And it's quite clear that we have a number of, of countries failing now. That is only going to increase and the situation get worse for the countries of the Caribbean in water. They're going to fail and they don't have the money to do desal. So I talked about a Puerto Rican study and, and we, we went to, since I'm an ecologist, we went back and we used general terms for it ecosystem resilience. And we did this relative to Hurricane Maria, which was the most devastating hurricane ever in the, in the Caribbean. We came up with um, four different ways of, of looking at the resilience. Resistance, it shows no significant change to a disturbance. Resilient, yeah, it'll change, but it'll bounce back to stability. Alternative stable state, It'll show insecurity, but it will then go to a new organization of the ecosystem or, or uh, whatever we're looking at and collapse, obvious, total failure. And it's, it's quite uh, common among ecologists and economists to recognize that these sorts of systems, e ecosystems and economic systems behave very, very similarly and they can be evaluated. So on the right is the uh, summary diagram of our study. The environmental factors are either really resilient or they'll go to an alternative stable state. Uh, so they are in the long term, very, very resilient. Infrastructure, total collapse, total failure. And then we get down to the two factors that we've hinted at by by Dr. Motar, and that is the community and the governance, they're both resistant. The communities are resilient, the people will respond. And we found the same thing in MENA, that people will respond to, to change, governance will not. And therefore, if you are resistant to change uh, in whatever form, you're going to witness call. So the way to look at this is we uh, formulated a whole bunch of ways. We've done this in, in, uh, in South America and, and elsewhere, looking at adaptive management. If you see a change coming in a component of the nexus, then how can you work with nature to come up with ways of battling it? Not engineering, because engineering is extremely expensive. And it has a lifetime. Nature does not have a lifetime. So if you have a nature-based solution, you're going to be very successful. And I'll give you some examples. So adaptive management says you need to get into water reuse, not for one purpose, but for multiple purposes. And you have to recognize that the problems that we're having are the response are creating is population agriculture, climate change. 
All of these go together. You cannot isolate them. So how do you get, we have to come up with a way of getting value added to promote stability. So how do you develop a product uh, from reuse of water? How do you add conservation habitat? How do you have ecotourism and passive recreation? How do you get an economic return? If the people see that their recycling of wastewater is going to feed back into their economy, it'll affect their stability. So where we're really moving now, and, and, I, and I know of a couple of people who are very good at this in, in Saudi Arabia, how does the, what is the private sector's role in infrastructure development? Uh, their job is how can they take something of, of wastewater and view it as a resource rather than, rather than a negative. And so the private sector we view as they have to be our partner because business is the circumscriber of the entire nexus. So economy, if you can get the people doing the economy, then they will support what you're doing. Several years now, I've been working in, in Morocco with the High Atlas Foundation in Marrakesh, uh, who is involved with uh, rural development and empowerment. And they have been planting fruit trees. Yeah, I'm gonna get that. Oh, okay. I, I couldn't see my slide because of the, uh, of the photographs. Uh, they're planting fruit trees to protect resources and support local economies. So going into watersheds, trying to have ownership, community ownership, to reduce urban and out-migration of people, keep people on the land. And you also have to be able to have that system, but adapt it to the climate change that is coming. And we know that climate change is coming, but how do we go through local communities and ownership? We're now focusing a lot of our effort on the new smart cities of, of MENA. And, and the question I'm, I'm looking at is, are they sustainable? And here are some, here are the ones that come to mind. Um, I don't have, I don't wanna talk in detail about any of these, but are they sustainable? Are they reusing everything to the maximum or are they trying to put too much engineering into it without putting nature into it? Overall, we must view cities as, eco, as ecological systems. We call it the urban biome, their, their own ecosystems. Cities must be able to recycle all of their resources. They must be able to design with nature to perform engineering tasks. And, and this, the last two are, are where I'm, I'm gonna really focus on. The consumer use must be near to the resource supply. In the old days, Gaddafi was pumping water from out in the center of Libya, pumping it to the coast. And, and we're thinking this is just is not sustainable because the longer you pump, the farther you pump water, you want your water to be reused. You want your, what, your consumers and your water to be together. In COVID, for example, we have found that the supply chain has been broken between urban and rural and we found that a lot of the, the things that consumers in cities needed didn't get in from the countryside. And the final point I can make over and over again is that green infrastructure is cheaper and longer lived than gray infrastructure. So the urban rural disconnect and nexus, <clears throat> we traditionally think of cities as being recipients of products. We need to shorten that supply chain and have cities as sustainable biomes producing a lot of their own food, recycling water and creating their own energy. Various techniques uh, that we'll go into it's used in cities all over the world, green rooms, constructed wetlands. I'll show you a couple of them. Um, the thing that we have to realize is that wastewater is a water source, it's a resource. The picture on the left is Gaza. Uh, domestic wastewater can be broken down into gray water or black water. We can reuse the gray water, and I'll show you some, some innovative ways that people are reusing it. On the left is a city uh, on the north edge of, of uh, Hong Kong. 
where they're taking stormwater and water from everything but the toilets in these apartment houses and created a wet a wetland, uh, which is a passive recreation. It's also a nature attractant, which is a big bird migration area. On the right is the most visited park in Orlando. Yes, or it's not Disney. It's a wastewater treatment plant where there are nature trails and this is a final polishing plant for the wastewater for the city of Orlando. Multiple use and reuse of water is key. Urban agriculture, Mexico is currently creating 30% of its own food. Uh, urban gardens are flourishing in Cairo uh, and expanding. This is the future, use that water. Use it as insulation. I was told uh, by a professor in Saudi a few years ago, oh, it's too hot in Riyadh to have, to have green roofs. But that's not true. And so use it as insulation for our buildings. Uh, so what is the, how do you value nature-based solutions? They're cost-effective. Uh, they can be multiple purposes. They can be owned by the local community and they can produce crops and products. The challenges to the nexus, the long-term change, climate and population, catastrophic weather events, drought in the Middle East, monsoons, hurricanes, and disease. We haven't even talked about COVID, but COVID has interrupted us point blank. Adaptive management is key. And I stress that over, it's the same slide I showed you earlier. You must be able to get social and economic acceptance of your of water reuse because sustainability promotes political stability. And so the modified nexus that I have is to take this basic nexus and on the outside of this, you have to put government because to me, governance is the principal factor that we have that is limiting our going forward. Uh, we see that in the Caribbean. Uh, we see it in the Middle East. And we like, we don't like to think, but we think of nexus instability promotes social and economic instability, which promotes political instability, which leads to societal collapse. And the conclusion, conclusions, um, right to the bottom. Well, you need a decentralized infrastructure that is based on natural solutions. You need to have adaptability to these, these long-term changes in population and, and climate. And the final thing that is coming out of what we're doing in both the Middle East and especially in, in the Caribbean, government's lack of planning and resistance to change is the overarching problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Thomas Cressman, uh, for the fruitful uh, presentation. I see Professor Rabia have a question. You're welcome. Thomas, thank you. Very well said. Sorry, we, uh, we won this weekend. We had a big win over... Uh... <laughs> that was a football game. Uh, Anyway, I, I, I support UF and not USF, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, that very well uh, said presentation. I'd like to uh, maybe have your thoughts on the the issues with the governance and, and the issues that uh, relates to the implementation. Uh, reflecting on, on the what we've been listening uh, from Texas, for example, in stakeholders meeting, you you meet with, with all of the stakeholders, they realize that the solution has to be at the system level. But then everybody goes back to their own mandate. Uh, you tell them, this is the solution that's needed. They tell you it's outside my uh, a utility, water utility person tells you, this is my job, I'm doing my job. And everybody is kind of, it's in the no man's land. The, the solutions are so system level that nobody owns them. How do, we, how do we change? How do we start that realization that uh, we recognize that solutions are at the system level? We need to reform 
our governance structure so that there, there will be synergy uh, and, and get away from this, it's not my job, I'm doing my job and this is outside my job. Th that's the biggest challenge we're facing, at least from, from uh, looking at our uh, experience here. There's there's a phrase in German that I love very much. Das ist nicht mein Bier. This is not my beer. It's not my job. Um, we've taken we've watched what's going on in Puerto Rico. When the power grid the the power grid which was never fixed and it's getting worse and worse and worse when it collapsed as a result of Maria, uh, you saw a few lights up in the mountains. Those are communities that, as a community, implemented solar. It's a Gandhi principle. So the next community has done it, the next community has done it. And before long, they're now going to the Commonwealth and saying, guys, it works, we want change. Your food problem is really an interesting thing because it's not food that's the problem. It is the high class commodities that people wanna bring in. And it, you know, so in Puerto Rico, there is so much land but the, but, and they depopulated the countryside and brought them to the city, but they wanna eat canned goods and they wanna eat frozen dinners from the United States. So if we, you could, you could supply the basic needs by having urban agriculture, what are those people gonna be growing? The basic commodities. So I think we have to show by example until government realizes that if they don't, if they don't do something about the stability, the long-term stability of the nexus, they're done for. And we actually have governmental people. We had, uh, for example, our, our latest one is, is St. Vincent, the island of St. Vincent in the Caribbean, which had an, uh, a volcano and destroyed their entire water supply, which they were taken from streams. They're scared because now they need to say, if you can't give basic services, you're gonna get political instability. So the only way that they're gonna respond is by the community and the people demonstrating and then coming to them and saying, you gotta change. Thank you. We should get together. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll drop you a note and we can uh, follow up because there's okay. a, lot of, uh, a, lot, a lot of things happening that that I would like to share. Even if you work with Purdue, that's okay. Went to <laughs> IU. <laughs> I have a question, um, if you allow me. Um, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, you, you mentioned that failure uh, happened because of uh, politics or policies. And um, I may agree with you, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, and um, especially when I saw that uh, picture from Gaza, uh, maybe I will add another dimension, which is the occupation as well, uh, rather than uh, politics. So yes, I agree with you. Um, uh, there are failures that is uh, happening here in, in uh, our region. Uh, my question, what, 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 what should the governments do in this regard? I think the government should be invited to fora such as this, where they can see, you have to come to the government. What, what governments, when I was in Washington, I, I was working in Washington, I learned that government is two things. If you talk to a congressperson, what are they gonna ask you? What does this do to the economy of my district? What does it do for the health of my people? So we as scientists made a big mistake. They don't care how much it stop raining or doing this. You need to put it in their terms so that we can sell it to them and they think we, they win. So if I can say, listen, listen, you're gonna actually increase your GDP by doing this. Oh, wow, okay. Or you're gonna have fewer riots or you're gonna have whatever it is. This is how we approach countries all over the Middle East and the Caribbean. And by the way, occupation, I'm quite familiar with that area. Occupation is part of politics or lack thereof. So it doesn't matter who's doing the governing, the policies are set, in this case, by the other country. 
Yes, thank you. Um, one more question, if you allow me, which yes. is uh, regarding the, um, the culture of the people. Now we are seeing some countries such as Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the most stressful uh, uh, countries in the world. At the same time, we see in some cities that the water consumption per capita is extremely high. It is comparable to the US and Canada. So what, what, what can you say about this? Education is one thing, and, and I'm a strong believer that if you want to change, the best way to change is to get to the kids. So get it in schools, educate people on how much water there is. And the other side of it is you use more water, you pay a heck of a lot more. So it has to be pricing of the water. It has to be education on what it means. Um, but I, I value a positive rather than a punishment uh, to try to get them to cooperate. But you have, you, you have in Saudi, what, what I've seen is there are places where it's tremendous water using. Uh, I, even even in, in Israel, they're doing the same thing. There's no signs that say conserve water. And they're, and they're running, they're depending on deeds out. The one thing I'm very impressed with is the new city in Saudi will have solar deeds out, which is not going to be reliant on fossil fuels at all. I'm very impressed with that. Okay, thank you. If you allow me, we have some question from Dr. Hussam uh, uh, Balusha. Uh, first question, how can water uh, affect stability when the GDP from agriculture, which is the uh, largest water consumer, uh, is, ne is neglectable? Who is the water, who is that uh, directed to, me? Yes, they write it to you. Agriculture is not sustainable for the most part outside of the cities in the Middle East. It is sustainable in the cities where you have a ready supply of water that you can use. And so rather than, than having agriculture so far out, uh, it, it, you, you go where you have the water and you have excess water in the cities that have, has to be used. I noted that the, uh, the new Cairo the plan is to have water features all over New Cairo, but a lot of that's going to be the result of treated wastewater. I'm thinking, you're, you're wasting the water. Use it. So agriculture, to me, cannot be a countryside event. It has to be moving into the cities. Another question. Uh, uh, how can desalination solve uh, the water scarcity problem when it is uh, depend on fossil uh, fuel, which is non-renewable? Um, as I said, what I'm, I'm impressed with uh, in the in the new uh, the new city in, in Saudi, desal is going to be based on solar energy, and I think that's going to be the model. You have what fifty some plants of desalination in Saudi Arabia based on fossil fuels, and and Saudi has a pledge now to totally get away from fossil fuels, and 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 I think you'll see a major change. Ah, and you know what? What's really neat about this is that the private sector must be engaged. The private sector must be the ones to say, we've got a problem. How about working with our scientists and our, and our political people to come up with a solution and you make money. So we, well, we always thought that the, the private sector was the enemy. No, they're not. The private sector is our friend. And our job as scientists is to support the private sector so that they can give us services back and help us all. And he asked also, what is about water equity in the Jordan Valley and Nile Basin? <laughs> well, Nile Basin, I, I, I know about, and I know a lot about the Jordan Valley. Uh, gee, what is it? It's called politics. Uh, Egypt is planning for less and less water getting to Cairo. And in fact, they're looking at a moving from direct intake of water from the river to infiltration through the banks. Uh, but that's not gonna do it. Uh, and what is it? It's politics where Ethiopia keeps the water. They're gonna control the discharge downstream. Um, 
in the Jordan Valley, uh, it's also politics, but the worst part of it of all is that the influx of refugees from both Israel and from uh, Saudi, I'm sorry, from Syria into Jordan, their population has swollen and they're being placed, especially from Syria, they're being placed in areas where there's no water. So that's a political thing. And it goes back to my thing. If we can't deal with the politicians, we will have no sustainability. Yes, you are welcome. Unmute yourself. Dr. Rabia, as a question. I'd like to amplify what Thomas was, was talking about. Uh, the IWRA has its 50th anniversary coming up. And there, there was a discussion about the role of the Nexus. And the question was the transboundary water and the water conflict. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I would be happy to share that piece, but I wrote a piece about the role of Nexus in this specific issue, focusing on water conflict. And the idea is our model that we have today is an allocative model. It's a pie and everybody has a piece of the pie. We don't look at the synergy. And I think we have an opportunity today to really reimagine the transboundary water agreement based on synergy. So I'll give an example. Uh, and this is not politics. I don't want to enter the politics the political arena because especially when you talked about the Jordan Valley is a lot of emotions. So let's put the politics aside and, and let's, let's take another river basin that, that maybe is not uh, uh, is neutral for most of the audience. Let's talk about the, the, uh, the India, uh, Pakistan uh, water transboundary water issues. If we could look at upstream and downstream, if upstream benefit from, from water for irrigation, let's make this synergistic that the upstream can provide maybe a subsidized food for downstream so that they can alleviate some of the irrigation needs. My point here is that the, the current crisis in, in transboundary water is a water energy food crisis. And it can only be solved, can only be solved by, by dialogue. And by looking at a different model, the pie is shrinking. We just realize that the pie is shrinking because of climate change. And the demand is increasing because of population and level of our water use, unsustainable water use. So the only way we're going to solve these issues is looking at the, the synergy and the dialogue based on the principles of who's losing, who's winning, and let's share that gain and let's share that loss. So the community as a whole would look at these synergies. Well, you're you're <laughs> you're from Texas. Uh, you have one of the most serious transboundary water issues around. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're having problems with New Mexico, who want the upper yeah. part of the yeah. Rio Bravo, uh, Rio Grande. Uh, you have Mexico, which is getting nothing. Yeah. Uh, the other one is the Mekong, which I follow very closely because the Mekong, China, China's building 16, 20 dams, or it's all that energy goes down. So to me, there's this new ecological, environmental colonialism that's based on transboundary waters. Yeah. And the one, the one that the, the other, the other two points that I'll, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm off target, but you got me going to something I, 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 I talk about. The second one has to do with uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a supplier of water for all of the Central Asian country. It's also the supplier of a lot of the water for Pakistan. And it also supplies the only water coming into southeastern Iran. That the other one in the Middle East is Turkey. Yeah. Turkey controls the water of everything downstream, including my beloved Mesopotamia marsh. And so transboundary and nexus, I like your idea, but how to, I would love to put together a team of people who could begin to talk on how to get transboundary cooperation. And I, I know in, in the State Department, they focused on, on the Nile and they focused on the Mekong, but I'm working in the Pantanal in, in, in Brazil, which the Pantanal wetland is the size of England. You have four countries that are cooperating. It's going to work. It can work. United States, you have two countries they can't cooperate either on the Colombia or on the Rio Grande. So, you know, we have to learn at home what messages that we can have. 
yeah. uh, and, and transport those. Again, this is something I would love to. Absolutely, and, and, and we have, the Nexus community have an obligation to put forward a new model for transboundary water based on the synergy rather than based on allocation. Allocation is not going to work. Pie is shrinking. Work. Yeah. Allocation shrinking. Work. The pie is shrinking. The demand is, is uh, increasing. We need a new model. So we'll be happy to talk about this. I do have a class. Uh, in fact, I'm 10 minutes late. Uh, so I, I'm American, have... so I have no classes. <laughs> <laughs> So I need to step out. It was a pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and uh, will we'll, to be continued. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. We Thank enjoyed you. Your, your, your speech, both of you, uh, and, uh, <laughs> as well as uh, Dr. Mansour, Dr. Jamie, uh, Dr. Declan, and uh, Mr. Tomsu. Thank you all for being with us. We appreciate the time and we look forward to see you again once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Salam. Salam.